On Thursday, a House Energy and Commerce subcommittee held a hearing to consider the Food and Drug Administration's enforcement policies. FDA Commissioner David Kessler appeared before the panel to give his view on the agency's ability to enforce regulations and to comment on a House bill that would expand the FDA's enforcement power. Next on C-SPAN 2, we'll bring you coverage of that oversight and investigation subcommittee hearing on the FDA. The proceedings were chaired by Representative John Dingell, Democrat of Michigan, a co-sponsor of the FDA Enforcement Powers Bill. The subcommittee will uh, come to order. Uh, Chairman Dingell has not yet arrived. We expect him momentarily, but we will, boy, we will proceed uh, with an opening statement by myself and the ranking minority member. This morning, the subcommittee will examine the responses of the Department of Health and Human Services and the Food and Drug Administration to a variety of problems uncovered by this subcommittee over the last several years. We have continuing concerns about serious deficiencies in the enforcement capabilities and actions of the FDA, which are exacerbated by the FDA's submersion in the HHS bureaucracy. We also remain deeply troubled about the continuing paralysis of the generic drug approval process and shortcomings in the FDA's regulation of medical devices. On the other hand, I am pleased to note uh, that there have been reforms undertaken in these areas as well as praiseworthy actions by the FDA in labeling, direct to consumer advertising, and blood safety. First, the history of FDA enforcement efforts has been marked by the failure of the FDA to take significant enforcement action against scofflaw generic drug firms until the scandal was uncovered by others and a dismally low rate of prosecutions under the broad criminal provisions of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act because of bureaucratic delays, over-lawyering, and cumbersome statutory procedures. Rather than use enforcement mechanisms provided under the law, the FDA relied on a combination of honor systems, bureaucratic nitpicking, and occasional use of its significant but informal and essentially unreviewed discretionary power. The Commissioner has announced some enforcement reforms, but this is only a beginning. The effective implementation of these reforms is critical, and that subject will be probed today. Will the 100 criminal investigators that have been promised, although yet not hired, be able to function effectively, or will they be muzzled by the cumbersome enforcement bureaucracy and FDA headquarters that has continued to hinder field enforcement efforts against generic drug firms? Will the new criminal referral process result in more, better, and expeditious investigations and prosecutions, or will it degenerate into the fragmented and chaotic system of second-guessing, delay, and fear of responsibility that existed before? Will the new civil enforcement process be able to react quickly to troubling inspection results, or will the headquarters and legal re-reviews again impose delays that require inspection work to be redone before action can be taken? Responsibility for enforcement problems at FDA also rests with the Department of Health and Human Services. Continuing problems with the department include, one, a chief counsel position at FDA that reports to the general counsel at HHS, not the commissioner. Two, an office of chief counsel that has frequently been a hindrance rather than a help to aggressive enforcement. Three, HHS re-review of proposed regulations and other FDA actions. Four, HHS reluctant to use the Inspector General's office to fill the interim gap in FDA criminal enforcement efforts. And five, inadequate political and policy support on enforcement authority legislation. Will HHS begin to justify its continuing supervision of the FDA by assisting in reform, or will HHS continue to be part of the problem? Will the lawyers become part of the solution or continue prior resistance to this subcommittee and to a lessening of their role. I note in this regard the comment of one former FDA lawyer since echoed by others, quote, when I was in the general counsel's office, we had a maxim. Whenever FDA proposed to do what we wanted, it was a policy call and their decision. But whenever we disagreed with FDA, it was a matter of law and they couldn't do it, end quote. 
Will the administration ever take a substantive position on H.R. 2597, the Food, Drug, Cosmetic, and Device Enforcement Amendments of 1991? I observe that a draft of the statement which Dr. Kessler was prepared to give in Congressman Waxman's subcommittee on health and the environment on July the 17th is attached to the briefing memo. Dr. Kessler, your views that were muzzled downtown should be of use to the members and to the public. And I ask unanimous consent that the briefing memo and attachments be placed into the record at the appropriate point. Second, the FDA's regulation of generic drugs remains a continuing source of dismay. The Kibbe reports discussed at length in the subcommittee's June 5 hearing revealed a system in disarray long after its problems were defined. Moreover, Inspector General has reported that in 1988, the FDA bureaucracy attempted to whitewash problems in the generic drug process and efforts to minimize the problems continue long after. And scarce resources have been spent continuing to review generic drug applications from firms so corrupt that anything they submitted was suspect. In July, the FDA submitted a management plan to improve the generic drug approval process. The subcommittee will be watching closely to see whether the top leadership at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research can, despite three years of presiding over failed efforts at reform, finally fix the approval process. If not, Congress will need to act. Third, the subcommittee has also scrutinized the regulation of medical devices. The subcommittee's February 1990 hearing and staff report on the Sheely Heart Valve exposed both the FDA's inexcusable laxity in enforcing the provisions of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, as well as Sheely's misfeasance and malfeasance. Agency documents chronicle the failure to effectively enforce the regulation under the Safe Medical Devices Act. Although the subcommittee has had assurances that another Sheely de debacle will not occur, the subcommittee will explore what may be a repeat situation involving the Collagen Corporation. The subcommittee is concerned about the FDA's previous unwillingness or inability to respond to repeated allegations of adverse health effects from the company's products and the collagen's inability to comply with the law and the regulations behind it. Recent enforcement actions, including the agency's seizure of $5 million of mislabeled collagen product and a warning letter to the company indicate a new get tough attitude. But more needs to be done, including a review of the approval of collagen's original application. If the application was approved despite what appears to be a flawed clinical practices procedure and data, the implica implication is significant. The FDA approval scores of pre-market approval applications for devices such as the Sheely heart valve and collagen products prior to establishing regulations to assure minimum standards of safety and efficiency. The subcommittee wants to know how the agency can assure consumers that its prior work was sound. The same question applies to the vast number of medical devices which are approved with even less scrutiny under the provisions of Section 510K of the Safe Medical Devices Act. Other concerns in the medical device area include, one, the excessive tardiness in the inspections of medium and high-risk device firms, two, infrequent inspection of foreign manufacturers, Three, the failure of firm to correct good manufacturing practices, problems from one inspection to the next. Four, failure of manufacturers to reduce their rate of GMP violations even after recalls. Five, inspectors lack of extensive knowledge required by the new device technology. And six, the failure of district offices to report violations to headquarters or to report sufficient information needed to assess patterns of device performance and defect. Fourth, the presence of continuing problems in enforcement, generic drugs, and medical devices is not the whole story. Efforts are underway to deal with many of these problems, including some productive actions against the many problem companies in the generic drug industry, and there are some other signs of progress at the FDA. Aggressive action on labeling is a start. Recognition of the threat to consumers posed by direct to consumer advertising and steps to increase FDA's role are also encouraging. The FDA's energetic efforts on blood safety have been much appreciated by this subcommittee and the public. 
The ultimate measure of Dr. Kessler's success will be the extent to which he can develop an effective, efficient, and accountable enforcement procedure within the FDA, have the HHS control lawyers serve the FDA rather than vice versa, direct and motivate, motivate an often reluctant bureaucracy, reform and re-energize the generic drug approval process, improve the regulations of medical devices, and accelerate the reforms already underway in other areas. The measure of HHS's success will be the extent to which it, one, insist, assists in these reforms, two, obtains the go-ahead to seek needed statutory enforcement authority, three, obtains administration approval to seek the necessary level of funding, or at least admits that the FDA is being shortchanged, and four, give the FDA needed authority and autonomy within the HHS bureaucracy. These issues are before the subcommittee today and will be pursued as long as necessary to assure the American people that the problems uncovered by the subcommittee are being resolved. I wish at this time to, rec uh, to recognize a gentleman from Virginia. I thank you, gentlemen. I want to join uh, my colleagues in uh, welcoming you, uh, Dr. Kessler and also your colleagues from FDA and the Department of Health and Human Services to this hearing on FDA issues of interest to the subcommittee. While I have said it before, it remains true that FDA is the most investigated agency within the broad oversight jurisdiction of this subcommittee. Given the problems we found in the generic drugs, medical devices, food imports, blood products, this scrutiny has been justified. It is also significant that we have proceeded on a bipartisan basis. Make no mistake about the fact that these problems began long before Dr. Kessler assumed his new duties earlier this year. The new commissioner certainly wasted no time in letting the consumer and the, related, and the regulated industries know that he was in charge of the agency in taking it in new directions. This prompted Business Week to print an article under the headline the FDA is swinging a sufficiently large two by four. It will come as no surprise to observers of this panel that members of the subcommittee are not bashful about letting FDA know how the so-called FDA two by four should be used. There are also efforts underway to sharpen the two by four, and we had a lively hearing on pending legislation in the Health and Environment Subcommittee in July. I expect we will hear more about that subject today. I am particularly interested in the status of efforts to jumpstart the generic drug approval process. At hearings earlier this year, we learned that the rate of approvals and reviews of pending generic drug applications has slowed to a crawl. Much of this relates to the resources diverted to mopping up after the generic drug scandal. But at some point, we have to get back to a better pace. In fact, it is now taking longer on average, to process a generic drug application than it does to act on much more sophisticated new drug applications. Again, we welcome Dr. Kessler and his colleagues and look forward to their testimony. Given its reach, over 25 percent of every consumer dollar spent in the marketplace, the FDA deserves the careful attention it will receive today. And I thank the gentleman. I yield back to balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the Chairman of the Full Committee and the Subcommittee, Mr. Dingle. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for recognizing me. I commend you for an excellent statement. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I look forward to working with you. I would like all to know that this subcommittee is fully determined to see to it that what I regard as a great institution, the Food and Drug Administration, returns to its former glories. To see to it that it has the funding that it needs, the personnel that it needs, the support here on the Hill that it needs, the support here uh, in Washington at the uh, departmental level, at the level of the Office of Management and Budget, and so that uh, Dr. Kessler, who I believe is making a good start and who is trying, is able to carry out the functions that I know he intends to carry out. I will express my distress about uh, what I regard as a rather indifferent attitude 
on the part of the Department of Health and Human Services towards the Food and Drug Administration uh, manifested in the interference which we observe in their actions, uh, rather than the actions of food and drug, the inadequacy of facilities, the inadequacy of salary, uh, the inability of the agency to carry out its mission, uh, the inadequacy of the number of personnel, uh, the inability of the both FDA and the Department of Health and Human Services over time to restructure that organization, to give it the support that it needs so that it can properly carry out its functions. This hearing today is a first step in that effort. It is one in which there is no partisanship. As my good friend Mr. Bliley has indicated, he is fully determined that we will achieve this goal. I am fully determined and I know that the rest of the members of the subcommittee are fully determined and I think that the department should look forward to uh, visiting with us frequently to discuss the level of progress that has been achieved, uh, failures which have been achieved, and I do, want the I do want the department to understand that we are about to cease pounding on Dr. Kessler and the head of the food and drug, and that we will shift our sights and shift our fire so that we may reach the next higher echelon in government so that they can understand their responsibilities to carry out their duties in serving the public interest. And I want them to know that the charities that we have shown the Food and Drug Administration over, the, over time will not be shown to the next higher echelon in government as they appear here before us to discuss the failures that are troubling to this committee. Thank you, Chairman. I want to thank all of you for being here this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our first panel consists of Michael J. Astru, who is General Counsel for the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the Honorable David A. Kessler, who is Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, and the Honorable Richard P. Cusero, Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, gentlemen, you have a copy of the rule to the subcommittee there uh, in front of you. It is customary uh, to uh, have witnesses at hearings sworn uh, in this subcommittee. Uh, to, do any of you object to testifying uh, under oath? If not, would you all please rise and raise your right hand? You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Consider yourself under oath. <laughs> Mr. Astru, we would uh, recognize you first for an opening statement and proceed in your own manner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I prefer just. To... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I prefer. I had only a brief written say, statement, which I submitted to the record. I prefer to submit that to the record. Without objection, the statement will be submitted for the, the record. Uh, Dr. Kessler, uh, we'll rep recognize you now for an opening. Mr. Cusero, I'm sorry. Mr. Cusero will, will be the next uh, person. Mr. Cusero, we would recognize you for an opening statement at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I did uh, submit to the committee uh, a fairly lengthy and elaborate um, written testimony that uh, also tracks uh, 11 reports that uh, uh, we uh, have submitted to the committee and, and will submit uh, for the record. Uh, with your permission, I'd like to uh, uh, proceed to highlight uh, my comments uh, for the sake of time and reserve as much time for questioning, if that is all right with the chair. Well, that'll be fine. Without objection, all written statements uh, will be submitted for the record, and you may abbreviate your statements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As it was uh, made in the opening comments uh, from the uh, subcommittee, uh, FDA is a, um, uh, a vital uh, link uh, to the American public for the protection of health and safety and as was pointed out 25 uh, cents of every consumer dollar is uh, subject to the regulation of FDA and they do that with a, uh, a very limited amount of resources. Uh, in, in terms of HHS if you were to uh, look at it, it would be uh, theoretically by outlays only a speck on the, on the wall of HHS because it's only it's a little bit over 1% of the outlays but, but it belies the importance of the agency in terms of how much it affects the daily lives of, of Americans. The mission is so wide and, and, and diverse that it's not surprising that FDA uh, oftentimes is forced to be uh, uh, moving from one issue to another responding to um, uh, uh, crises uh, of, the, of the moment. The thrust of my testimony was really on five different uh, major points. Uh, that is the uh, need to restore the integrity of FDA's product approval process and therefore restore public confidence in that uh, process. Secondly, the need to vigorously detect and investigate potential fraud and abuse related to uh, uh, FDA's mission. Third is the need to invigorate FDA's inspection and manu of manufacturing and processing facilities. Fourth, the need to strengthen FDA's response to individuals and businesses out of compliance with the act. And then uh, fifth, 
the need to create a uh, data management system which will provide useful necessary information for planning uh, and oversight of these activities. Uh, with regards uh, to um, uh, the restoring of um, uh, the um, uh, integrity to the product review uh, approval process, among the reports that we had submitted was uh, some rather detailed analyses and reviews of the whole process that identified material weaknesses and problems that they had in managing, managing that process. We're in the process now of following up on that to uh, see uh, what steps and what progress that FDA has made in correcting those uh, uh, deficiencies. We've also uh, have, as part of the reports that we submitted to the record, uh, our uh, evaluation of drug master file reviews by the uh, Food and Drug Administration, which uh, documented that uh, uh, a lacking in policies or procedures uh, at uh, FDA to really uh, require review of the drug uh, uh, master file. Uh, as a result of that, uh, there's an inconsistency in the way those uh, uh, pr uh, uh, proposals or those uh, uh, requests are handled. Uh, the, um, a number of other things uh, in terms of um, uh, internal control weaknesses are not only applicable for the um, generic uh, drug approval process, but we've also found that there were other approval processes at um, uh, FDA and therefore had applicability in, in trying to develop management information systems that would allow a better tracking by managers as to how FDA was carrying out its mission. Fortunately, um, as we had a very careful look at um, other approval processes, even though we did find similar types of uh, weaknesses as we did in the generic uh, drug division, we did not find any evidence of the kind of corruption that we encountered in our investigations uh, of the generic uh, drug division. In terms of um, the need to vigorously detect and investigate um, potential fraud and abuse, uh, I share the committee's concern that uh, 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 as to uh, when uh, we can look forward to um, FDA uh, being able to field a credible investigative um, resource uh, to look at the uh, crimes of uh, guile and deceit, misrepresentation, and, and fraud. Uh, from the reviews that we have made, some of which were at the uh, subcommittee's request, we have found that uh, that has not yet reached the field, and as a result of that, uh, opportunities uh, for uh, resolving fraudulent situations have been lost uh, or delayed. Uh, with regards to the invigorating the FDA's inspection of manufacturing and processing facilities, uh, we had a lot of concerns about um, how uh, resources were utilized and whether they were utilized to best advantage. We noted also in our testimony that uh, our conclusions and findings were shared by the Edwards uh, Commission. Uh, we have also uh, looked not only in the um, uh, pharmaceutical products uh, and the drug uh, approval processes, but we've also looked at uh, device uh, approvals, but also how devices are handled in the marketplace when they are found to be uh, uh, defective. We also had made comments about the ro uh, low risk um, uh, food firms and the inspections of them. And we see that FDA's ability to manage in that area has been uh, diminishing uh, greatly over the last few years. Our suggestion to them is that uh, they are r quite right in our judgment in redirecting their resources to higher priority areas, but that uh, perhaps they can look for other means by which they can uh, have the lower risk areas uh, uh, covered. And we made some suggestions uh, in our testimony as to that as well with regards to the need to strengthen FDA's response to individuals and businesses out of compliance with the Act. Uh, it's clear that uh, FDA needs to be fortified uh, in carrying out its mission. Certainly, uh, FDA has to be able to um, uh, compel records that they need to make decisions about uh, whether the uh, public um, uh, health uh, is at risk. Uh, they need uh, not only access to records, but they need to have uh, some ability whereby uh, they can speedily and uh, move ahead to take products off the market if they represent a uh, health or safety risk to the uh, American public. Uh, also, uh, quite frankly, is that uh, there's got to be something between no action and a, a criminal prosecution by which you can bring com people into compliance and we think some sort of monetary penalty, uh, a fortification of FDA uh, would be uh, appropriate and we were interested in seeing that in some of the bills that are being considered by the committee uh, at this time. Uh, we also noted that, that, uh, that FDA is always dealing in a constantly evolving and changing environment. 
and they, uh, there are always new problems and challenges that are presented to them, and it almost seems as if there's no end to that process, and certainly I cannot see uh, where there is going to be any end of that uh, process. I cannot tell you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, how surprised I was when the Chilean uh, grape um, uh, problem occurred, because when I first heard about it, I said, thank God it's not HHS and not FDA, and it was HHS and it was FDA. But again, these new challenges are presenting themselves constantly right now. One of the areas of uh, challenge to them uh, is going to have to deal uh, with uh, drug promotions and what the uh, pharmaceutical industry is doing with regards uh, to um, uh, promoting their products. In some cases, uh, it's unethical. In other cases, it's actually uh, illegal. Uh, there's a lot of disguised arrangements by which they can influence, trying to influence physicians in the decisions as to what um, uh, pharmaceutical products that they should prescribe for their patients, and uh, uh, this will be definitely a new challenge uh, to them in the future. Finally, in the area to um, uh, uh, create useful data management systems that I mentioned earlier, uh, in the day-to-day -day effective operations of FDA, the Commissioner needs more information and the management staff need more information as to how processes are working, where there are problems, and be able to detect them before they become a major crises. And uh, well, we are uh, pleased that they're beginning to make progress in um, uh, that uh, general arena. The last point I would make, Mr. Chairman, is that um, uh, I, too, as was suggested um, uh, by the committee, have been impressed with Dr. Kessler coming in. One of the problems I think that traditionally we've had with uh, commissioners at FDA is that, as I think it's not unlike um, having a situation where a paramecium is asked to sit on an amoeba and gets engulfed in a very short order. Uh, having one person brought in to provide new direction and to provide uh, uh, a, a, to be the catalyst for change is very, very difficult. I've been very much heartened by uh, not only uh, Dr. Kessler's actions to date, but by the fact that also that he has developed a management team that would assist him in effecting changes. For indeed, uh, I think that it's fair to say that uh, the commissioner of FDA is really not a skipper of a destroyer able to turn on a dime, but is more or less uh, trying to uh, uh, steer a uh, 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 a super tanker of some sort, which is very difficult to maneuver in uh, short term, and uh, therefore all the help that he can get along that line, uh, I think, uh, uh, would be, uh, I'm sure, grateful to the office of the commissioner, but also if it be in the public's interest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I reserve whatever time I would have to any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Kuzro. I was interested in the analogy that you drew with the paramecium and the amoeba, and. Um, since I've been in Congress, I've noticed that uh, a good paramecium will come in and that amoeba down there somewhere would gradually engulf that paramecium and uh, paramecium would then become part of that, that problem that existed. So well, I, in a struggle between a paramecium and an amoeba, I think it's fair to bet on the amoeba in almost every case. I believe you got it right. Thank you very much. Dr. Kessler? Mm. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, Today I'd like to begin by focusing on two areas of particular concern to this subcommittee, enforcement and generic drugs. I have said it from the start and I will reiterate it today, we take the statute very seriously. Nothing is more important to this agency. The American people expect us to enforce the law. We know that Congress too expects the FDA to protect and promote the public health and to promote fair dealing in the marketplace. We will not let the public down. We will enforce the law. We captured the nation's attention earlier this year by seizing processed orange juice because it was falsely labeled as being fresh. Mr. Chairman, the agency's actions on processed products mislabeled fresh have, have less to do with freshness than with the way we enforce the law. Ultimately, these actions have to do with whether the will of the people, as expressed in the nation's food and drug statutes, will be respected. In this town, people and agencies tend to be judged ultimately on what they do and not on what they say. Our recent actions involve many types of violations across a broad range of FDA-regulated products. The stand against foods mislabeled as fresh was only the beginning. We have serious reservations about products with other misleading claims. We have also acted when the deception adversely affects the public health. Last month, FDA initiated a seizure action 
against certain injectable collagen products because their manufacturer failed to include a warning in their labeling about the possible link between injectable collagen and connective tissue diseases. The month before, FDA initiated a seizure of natural skin condoms after the manufacturer ignored the agency's insistence that the firm make labeling changes to warn against the use of these condoms to prevent sexually transmitted diseases. In recent months, FDA has given high priority to actions against the inappropriate promotion of regulated products. In June, we secured an agreement with a major pharmaceutical firm on its promotional practices. Mr. Chairman, I know you and your colleagues have followed with considerable interest the direct consumer promotion of prescription drugs. As a physician, I too am very concerned about direct-to-consumer promotion. Although these types of ads appear both on television and in the print media, they are far less common on network television because of the legal requirement that such ads contain a brief summary of side effects, contraindications, and effectiveness. I believe the public in general is not well served by ads for prescription drugs. A great number of direct-to-consumer ads have appeared in print. These print ads have essentially reproduced the brief summary originally drafted for physicians. We must evaluate whether our current brief summary requirement ensures the direct-to-consumer ads provide fair balance in the presentation of risks and benefits of a drug. We need to look at whether consumers would be better served through translating the medical language into plain English. I intend to monitor direct-to-consumer advertising very closely and to require a strict adherence to the law. Another important enforcement issue is the marketing of unapproved new products. Late in July, the agency initiated a seizure action against a brand of breast implants that was being marketed without FDA's approval. Also at our request, several seizures were made of unapproved amino acid products. The illegal commercialization of investigational products has prompted several FDA enforcement actions. This July, a medical device firm agreed to agency demands to cease marketing unapproved saliva collection test kits for antibodies. More recently, FDA moved against a manufacturer of investigational tumor market test kits that were being commercially promoted and sold in violation of the law. In recent months, the agency has uncovered GMP violations involving seafood, medical devices, human drugs, and biological products. In addition, FDA recently seized all of a device manufacturer's jaw implants and product components because of the manufacturer's serious violations of good manufacturing practices. One last enforcement example. This subcommittee has appropriately shown interest in the safety of blood and blood products. We share your interest and concern. Over the past fiscal year, FDA has revoked the licenses of 11 blood banks and plasma centers and has, has initiated proceedings to suspend operations at another nine centers. Our work continues in this area. I think numbers sometimes oversimplify, and I'm not here to emphasize statistics. But I would like, Mr. Chairman, to give you a sense of some of the current enforcement trends. On chart one, during the first 10 months of fiscal year 1991, we have already referred 37 criminal cases to the Department of Justice, approximately 50% more than in all of 1990. Chart two, we have compressed the processing time dramatically. Cases now take one half or even one third as long in the past. Chart three, injunctions refer to justice have increased. 17 so far in fiscal year 1991, compared to nine for all of 1990, and 13 for 1989. Perhaps more important, the average interval between an FDA district office recommendation for an injunction and actual referral to justice has decreased. From approximately five months last year, and part of this year, to 30 days since May. Our sample is still small, but it is a beginning. During the first 10 months of the current fiscal year, 
FDA has referred 124 seizure cases to the Justice Department. This pace is more or less equal to the 144 seizure cases referred during each of the previous two years. I want the subcommittee to be aware of these numbers, but I do not want to rest my case on them. The goal of enforcement is not to keep score and ring up impressive numbers. The goal of enforcement is to achieve compliance with the law. One action sometimes goes a long way. Mr. Chairman, the second major topic I want to cover this morning involves the Drug Price Competition and Patent Term Restoration Act of 1984. That statute embodies a fundamental principle, the FDA's affirmative obligation to ensure that important generic drugs reach the market as quickly as possible and that they are safe and effective. FDA's generic drugs program has improved considerably in the past two years. The way we review drugs before the generic drugs, drug scandal, and now is vastly different. FDA has devoted much attention to ensuring the generic drugs are safe and are appropriately manufactured. This has been achieved through extensive product analyses, plant inspections, and a significant improvement in the quality of the science-based standards applied to generic drug approvals. The time has come to further intensify our efforts on the approval of generic drug products. There are some good signs. Productivity is on the rise. The Office of Generic Drugs approved 16 abbreviated new drug applications in, in July and 21 in August. So far this year, there are 108 newly approved generic drug applications compared to 80 in all of 1990. Our backlog is down from 660 to 346. More important, economically significant generic drugs must enter the market. In July, we approved the first legitimate generic version of diazide, the leading diuretic antihypertensive drug. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Roger Williams heading up the Office of Generic Drugs. A lot of change have already, has already taken place. New directors of chemistry start on Monday. There's a new training branch. There's public, uh, the publication of the fraud policy very recently. A tracking committee has been instituted for all ANDA reviews. And there's been a streamlining of amendments and better document control. But these changes are not enough. FDA is absolutely committed to making safe and effective generic drugs available to the American consumer. We want to be able to meet the review timetable set by the Congress. We are exploring new frameworks for achieving this goal. Let me tell you of some of the things we are considering. To reduce the backlog of pending generic drug applications, we will seek new ways to integrate the work of FDA headquarters and field activities more effectively. I am convinced that more can be done. If we can eliminate redundancies, then we can improve the overall review process and conserve resources. I expect that some aspects of applications that are now jointly handled by FDA field and headquarters personnel can be more efficiently examined by field personnel as part of the pre-approval inspection process. I have in mind such aspects of the applications as facilities, manufacturing processes, raw material controls, and laboratory controls. If we, if we could reallocate some of these shared tasks, our expert headquarters reviewers would be free to devote more time to the highly complex technical questions associated with synthesis of the bulk drug substance, definition of product specifications, and other technical issues. I have asked a team that I have recently assembled to develop a program that will strengthen and streamline FDA review processes in the field and at headquarters alike. It will not be done overnight. Do not underestimate the enormity of the task. We are also examining the current situation with its, with its backlog of hundreds of applications from a new vantage point. Principles of justice and fairness suggest that FDA should deal with these applications in strict order. 
so that they are reviewed in their order of filing. That is essentially the basis of the current system. I believe that in most cases, once we complete the changes in our approval process, even blockbuster drugs can be routinely reviewed within 180 days. Nevertheless, occasionally, it may be in the public interest for the commissioner to expedite the review of an important generic drug. To provide for this possibility, the Office of Generic Drugs has been asked to develop a policy and procedure guide to describe the circumstances under which the commissioner might choose to exercise discretion and expedite the review of an economically or therapeutically significant generic drug. We also need to take a bold and creative look at the process by which generic drugs are developed. Now they are developed through a kind of reverse engineering, with the result that no two generic drug firms make a generic copy of a pioneer drug in the same way. An FDA must uncode the engineering process, an enormous undertaking. Is there a better system? One approach which Dr. Williams is exploring would be to have a system of monographs or guidelines for generic drugs. If we were to compare making generic drugs to the much simpler process of cooking, the system of monographs or guidelines might mean giving the recipe to those who wanted to make a particular dish. And more importantly, FDA would know up front what's in the product and how it is to be manufactured. Although I know that this possibility raises many, many potential complications, it is quite simple conceptually. Potential generic drug manufacturers would only have to find acceptable ingredients and show they can manufacture drugs. FDA would then only need to assess the firm's ability to produce high quality drugs consistently. There are few instances where I can point to where we can actually save resources. This area may be one. Whether this idea ultimately proves useful remains to be seen, but we are considering it. We are pushing ahead, but if we find that we are not able to keep pace, then we have to be ready to consider other alternatives. Should the need arise, we will not hesitate to do just that. But we are not yet where we want to be or where we need to be. You have my pledge today that we will stay on top of this important issue. Many important drugs are coming off patent, and we have an obligation to get generic versions safely on the market. We will look forward to the subcommittee's constructive advice as the system evolves, just as we will rely on your support when it is needed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kessler. We appreciate that uh, commitment very much. The chair recognizes the chairman, Mr. Dingle. Chairman, I thank you. Dr. Kessler, welcome to the committee. Doctor, when you testified before the Subcommittee on Health and Environment on July 17 on H.R. 2597, the Food Drug Device Cosmetic Enforcement Amendments of 1991, you stated that it was a desire of the administration to speak with one voice. We noted that you spoke with one voice. Uh, we, are never, we are not sure, however, whether it was your voice or the voice of OMB that we were hearing. Uh, the committee derived the distinct impression that you were under a gag order. And my first question is, are you uh, now free to speak your own thoughts, or, are you, or do you continue to be compelled to present only the administration's views on the substance of the legislation? Mr. Chairman, on the issue of legislation, it is not simply that we speak with one voice. It is important for an administration to speak uh, with a consensus. The administration is not a monolith. It's composed of many, many people. Um, but it is, when we come before the Congress, it is important, uh, before we take a position on a piece of legislation, uh, that there be a consensus. Well, I would, note, I would note that you were not able to take a position when you appeared before the committee on the last occasion because the administration apparently had none. Does the administration now have a position on that legislation? Mr. Chairman, the, the matter still uh, is under active discussion. Uh, there is no formal position yet on the legislation. You should, know, you should know that time passes. The problems of the Food and Drug Administration are substantial. We want you to be clothed with adequate responsibilities. A current 
and modern statute as opposed to an obsolete collection of provisions which benefit neither you or, nor the consuming public of the United States, nor for that matter the industry. Uh, and the patience of the Congress uh, is limited by the fact that this Congress will end at the end of 1992. It is my intention to address this business before that time limit has expired. Uh, Dr. Kessler, since the administration has still not been able to come forward with a position on, 18, on uh, H.R. 2597, the committee will have to uh, uh, infer that you and Secretary Sullivan favor uh, a particular position by referring to perhaps other documents. First, I assume that you are familiar with the recommendation of the Secretary's Advisory Committee, the Edwards Commission, which you will remember until you resigned to become Commissioner. Are you not? I am familiar with those documents. Those recommendations included the general principle that FDA should have the same authorities for all products it regulates, as well as specific power to issue subpoenas, detain products, inspect production and shipment records, impose civil penalties, and presume that goods regulated by the agency moved in interstate commerce without the need to provide it in each instance. Uh, do you agree with the recommendations to which you uh, uh, ascribed when you were a member of the Ed Edwards Commission at this time, or do, you, or, or, or do you take no position on those views? Mr. Chairman, my views on, uh, have not changed since I've been a member of the Edwards Committee. Uh, I addressed the matter in my uh, confirmation uh, testimony. Uh, I think it is a very high priority uh, to be looked at. Um, I, I hope we can forge a consensus. I know Secretary Sullivan believes firmly. Uh, we are trying to do that. Um, I think it is a very high priority. We cannot send um, inspectors into the field with their hands tied behind their back, uh, but we are not ready to say what are the priorities, which ones um, really uh, are the things the agency needs, um, and it, uh, associated with each one of those uh, issues. Um, there are a lot of issues, and we have not come to closure. Now, in the draft testimony prepared by the FDA for presentation by you on July 17 of this year before Chairman Waxman's subcommittee, a number of legislative recommendations were contained. The first was the need for FDA to obtain the authority to inspect records at food, cosmetic, and over-the-counter drug establishments to determine if the public health is endangered. The second was the need for temporary embargo authority against violative products. The third was the need for recall authority, and the fourth was the usefulness of civil money penalties. Uh, you, this was a statement which was prepared for you or by you. Uh, it was killed by others in the administration. If it had not been killed by others in the administration, am I incorrect in assuming that you would have proceeded to present that statement to Mr. Waxman's subcommittee? Mr. Chairman, the, the way an administration goes about um, coming up with a consensus, uh, there are many different people involved. Um, what you're referring to are drafts of testimony. Uh, they, are, they are written by many different people. They are drafts. They go through an iterative process. Uh, we were not able to forge a consensus. Um, and it's a consensus that I would like to be able to come before this committee and talk about. I thought it was a splendid statement. I don't think you ought to damn it with faint praise at all. It set out the authorities which I, I think you desperately need to conduct your business. Apparently, Mr. Cousero, uh, uh, from his statement today, seems to think that at least some of those authorities are desperately needed. You sit at an agency which uh, causes you to be before this committee uh, to uh, receive the tender attentions of, of an unenthusiastic committee. Uh, thoroughly displeased by the inability of your agency to properly protect the consumers while uh, the administration sits around and, and apparently plays mumbly peg trying to figure out whether it's for or against your statement or whether it's for or against additional authorities or whether, it's, it, whether it wants to adequately protect the American consumers. And I sit here gnashing my teeth because I can't get down to writing legislation that I think you desperately need to carry out your responsibilities. Now this is a sorry mess, is it not? Mr. Chairman, I'm not wasting any time. I am not waiting. I mean, I, as you may know, I, I served uh, as staff. Legislation takes an awful, I mean, especially in areas as complex, it does not happen overnight. I, I need, and I have to assure you, Mr. Chairman, um, that we're, gonna, we're not waiting for new legislation to be able to enforce the law be able to protect the public. We're doing everything possible now.
that is uh, my highest priority. Th there, there's no question that uh, I think that, that we need to look very hard at the priorities that were set in that testimony. I would like to come to a consensus. I sat before the, the Energy uh, and Environment Subcommittee. There wasn't a consensus there. It's going to take some time. I am not going to wait. I am not going to let time pass before I start enforcing the law. We can enforce the law. We can get to the result we need. It may not necessarily be the most efficient but we can do an awful lot, and that's what I'm pledged. This, this is a fine answer, and it does you great credit. I want you to know that, and you have my respect. It is, however, not an answer to the question which was directed to you. My concerns are that while you sit around there waiting for those above you in the hierarchy of government to come to a position which appears to be um, desperately needed on the basis of the inadequacy and the agreed inadequacy of your powers, uh, bad things are happening out there and there is a huge wastage of resources of the Food and Drug Administration. You apparently have a position for greater and more intelligent use of resources and for better statutory authority to enable you to function better. That feeling does not seem to have reached higher in the administration's hierarchy. This distresses me. I don't know whether it distresses you or not, but I must assume it does, knowing you as I do. It, it leaves us, however, with a vast sense of dissatisfaction. We are told to wait. We are told that you are arriving at a decision. In the meantime, your agency flounders, has inadequate resources, hopelessly inadequate facilities, uh, statutes which are obsolete, inability to address major problems in an efficient and competent way, one which is fair both to industry and to consumers. Uh, we have had you before the committee on now to, uh, this committee or subcommittees of it on at least two occasions during which you have you have given evidence of significant frustration at your inability to adequately speak out on an important subject. I guess the next step is going to be to invite Dr. Sullivan before us and if he can't tell us I guess maybe then we're going to have to invite the head of OMB before us to perhaps explain why it is that the administration cannot come to an intelligent position on a badly needed piece of legislation. Do you have a comment? I am prepared, Mr. Chairman, to discuss the, uh, the, the issues involved, uh, what would be solved by certain provisions uh, of the bill. Uh, I am prepared to talk about the issues, some of the concerns I have, um, but I'm not prepared to say that the administration supports or doesn't support. That's, I mean, I, I think a lot of work can be done. I think we can uh, talk substantively um, on, on many of the issues. I think, though, the administration deserves to have a consensus uh, and has the right to have a consensus before it's presented before our Congress. Well, Doctor, um, I'm going to ask then that, that an article which appeared in the Wall Street Journal on September 12th, interestingly enough, today, uh, entitled, Fight to Expand FDA Role Puts Chief in the Middle. Uh, I ask you now, can that, can that be inserted in the record, Mr. Chairman? Not objection. Uh, I think my time has expired, and, and I will have further questions, but uh, I, I don't want to transgress on the time of the committee, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cruz Rowe. In August of uh, 1989, the OIG released a report on the generic drug application review process which disclosed numerous weaknesses that enabled FDA employees and drug firms to manipulate the application process for their benefit. Have you conducted a follow-up review to determine whether FDA has implemented the corrective steps you recommended in the August 1989 report, and if so, what have you found? Mr. Chairman, we're in the process of doing just that, uh, doing a follow-up uh, review, and uh, there is a lot of progress uh, being made. Uh, perhaps it might be worthwhile to uh, recount some of the major points that we were concerned about and what we're currently looking at, and I can kind of give you an update a little bit as to how things are progressing. One of the concerns that we had in the 89 report um, was a general a failure of the branch chiefs to really adequately monitor and uh, report uh, to the division director on the on the progress of um, uh, abbreviated new drug application reviews, uh, the tracking is is essential. I think that you have to have the ability to know 
what is moving through the system, if it gets um, uh, uh, trapped along the way in some way, to review that to see whether that the slowdown is, um, is uh, reasonable and it's because of due diligence or for other purposes or uh, conversely if it's speeding up, um, uh, why is it speeding up? Is it because that it's really in such excellent condition or is it for other reasons? This is the area that I referred to in my testimony as the management information systems that were really um, uh, uh, lacking. Uh, there is progress being done in that area. We are holding back a uh, uh, coming to closure on it because uh, FDA is still working to upgrade it. They're not satisfied with the progress they've made so thus far and they've asked to have an opportunity to continue uh, improving on it before we look at it and we are convinced that they are making progress and so on that aspect of it we're uh, holding up until we see what, uh, what finally emerges from their effort. Another area that uh, we were concerned about is uh, was the area of how the the ANDAs were uh, assigned to uh, reviewing chemists. Uh, as you know uh, Mr. Chairman, in our investigations, uh, we found that one of the major problems uh, that um, uh, led to the corruption within the division was the fact that that uh, there that there could be a steering of a um, uh, an ANDA to a specific chem a chemist, and we wanted to be sure that a level uh, playing field was developed so that everybody who was submitting applications would um, uh, have the same chance of having uh, a, 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 a the same kind of review being performed so that they were competing fairly. We felt that we needed to have a lot more policies and procedures uh, for the random assignments uh, to the reviewing chemists and um, uh, we feel that more work needs to be done in this area. Uh, it has not been fully implemented whereby they're done on a random basis. Uh, there are some special problems that Dr. Kessler has made us aware of that uh, makes it hard to, uh, to make this a, um, uh, uh, to work in, a, in a, an absolutely perfect uh, setting, but I think that we could agree that uh, improvement is still warranted and we should uh, be able to um, um, uh, improve on that. Another area that we had a lot of problems with uh, was the fact that uh, you would have a chemist sitting side by side with some with a factor of workload ten times that of uh, the person sitting at the adjacent desk. Uh, that has uh, the um, evening out of the workload has uh, been largely achieved and we're very pleased uh, uh, about that. Ultimately, what we'd really like to try to get to as, as, quick, as quickly as possible, but also as fairly as possible and reasonably as possible, is the idea of first in, first out. And that is, is that uh, uh, these uh, drug applications are reviewed in the order in which they're received. Now, that doesn't work, cannot work perfectly, but we think that there's still room for an awful lot of improvement, and thus far that has not really um, uh, uh, been done. We've also looked at uh, the whole area of policies and procedures. We uh, feel that there's a lot more work needs to be done to set up policies and procedures that, uh, that would ensure uh, a uh, that that all chemists are doing the same thing, looking at the same uh, at the applications, the, the generally the same way, and receiving the same amount of uh, attention. And we think there's a lot more work that needs to be done. I would add that uh, the Kibbe report uh, that was released in April of this year uh, also um, uh, shared our concern about that uh, about this not having been adequately um, uh, implemented. Um, there are a number of other issues in there, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to go into in more detail if you like. But generally speaking, what I think I can sum up by saying is that that there's been a lot of progress made in uh, putting that level playing field in for drug applications received from pharmaceutical companies. Uh, but a lot more needs to be done. One of the areas where uh, we still are having a lot of uh, discussion, and that is, is that we believe there should be a quality control function that should be independent of the chain of command that should uh, check on the process and see if there are unevenness in the, in the way um, uh, applications are being handled. But uh, I think that progress is being made, but I think a lot more work needs do, to be do done. Do we say that uh, you're generally satisfied? Uh, oh, you'll never get the Inspector General to say he's fully satisfied. I, I, I'm, and to make, say I'm generally satisfied is a big concession on my part. But what I will say is that uh, progress is being made. Uh, we will work with FDA as we have over the last couple of years uh, and to, uh, to, uh, to make ourselves uh, satisfied uh, and if not we will certainly let FDA know. Well are you comfortable that they are moving as, uh, as you would want them to? Uh, I'm comfortable that there is movement. I think that I would, I'm not satisfied with the rate of movement. I'd like to see a, a faster movement. The problem that we have though, and, and I think Dr. Kessler would be more than happy to elaborate on if you'd like, 
is the fact is the balancing consideration, and that is that you had raised, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, the concern about uh, delays in the approval process, the length of time to approval. So uh, the FDA is going to have to balance the time it takes to make these reviews against the internal controls you place in there, which have a, t have a tendency to delay a little bit. So it's a balancing act. My concern is, is that I, I don't want to see FDA get so driven by speeding up the process that they fail to implement the internal control deficiencies that gave rise to the original problem in the first place. All right. Well, let me move on to another, another area. Based on your review of the <coughs> FDA Denver District, <coughs> what comments can you make regarding the investigative abilities of the FDA staff there? I, I think that in the two areas where you, um, uh, the, the subcommittee had referred us to uh, both Den Denver and Orlando, what we found is something similar, and that is the, uh, they're not quite yet uh, in a position to um, uh, handle certain types of uh, criminal investigations. They're still in the process of fielding a, um, uh, a trained uh, uh, investigative workforce. Uh, the staff that's in the offices, uh, uh, quite frankly, uh, in both cases, we found that uh, they were quite competent um, in the inspection's responsibility and in their um, uh, scientific and quasi-scientific responsibilities and understanding to protect the uh, health and safety of uh, the public. But when it came into the uh, crimes of guile, deceit, and fraud, uh, and uh, uh, and other areas of uh, criminal enforcement that have been newly apply, uh, assigned to them, they are not yet trained or able to handle it. What role, if any, does the IG still have in FDA criminal investigations, and what role does the IG envision in the future? And we'd kind of appreciate a brief answer. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's the hardest question, uh, the hardest thing that uh, you've uh, made me. Okay, let me see if I can do it briefly. Uh, our role certainly is where there is employees involved in corruptive behavior or misconduct, we, uh, that is our responsibility. In the other areas of criminal uh, violations, uh, we will stand by in, uh, and assist uh, when asked for by FDA. Otherwise, we do not plan to have a criminal investigative program for FDA. What uh, was your reaction to the reports by the Gibby panel, particularly that of Mr. Cope? of your office who observed that the approval process is equal but inequitable, and Mr. Zarembo who criticized the Office of Generic Drugs for having an atmosphere of arrogance in the approval process. Well, generally speaking, the uh, findings of the, uh, in the Kibbe report are a parallel of that which we came up with, and that is, is that uh, we have frustrations too, and we'd like to see that a lot of the problems get cleared up and they get cleared up very quickly. Um, with regards to the arrogance side, I think that you'll always find that there's a defensiveness within bureaucracies. Um, having outsiders come in are, are repelled. I hate to go into medical examples, but uh, I think that when we come in, we're like a foreign body that gets attacked by the uh, white corpuscles of the agency. So I, don't, I think in that respect, it could be interpreted by outsiders who are not used to uh, that kind of reception as arrogant behavior. Uh, we would say that it's a normal defensive behavior of, um, uh, of a, um, uh, a bureaucratic organization. Thank you, Mr. Cusro. The chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, a question of Dr. Cusro. Uh, I think uh, he's used the word arrogant behavior several times and certainly caught my attention. Now, Mr. Chairman, as you know, our system here is that we take testimony and testimony is recorded uh, we, most of us, have uh, assistants who are here who listen to the testimony, but it is recorded and members read it and study it later who don't get the opportunity to set in and observe the demeanor of those who are testifying, uh, nor do they uh, have the opportunity to cross-examine them when they're not here. So I think it's important that we uh, not just put the resume of uh, those who testify into the record, but that uh, we have some matters in the record on which other members can judge the credibility of the Inspector General, uh, the credence to be given to his testimony, and the weight to be given to, and the believability of him. Uh, I think that needs to be in this record. And uh, I'll, I'll ask Dr. Cusero a question after I read something into the record, and I guess my question to him will be whether or not he's the same Dr. Cusero that uh, appeared on Prime Live ABC television uh, with Diane Sawyer, Chris Wallace, and others. 
at a time when uh, they were questioning some of the practices. Now this is a medical uh, involved hearing, uh, physician harassment. Uh, now we're talking about new generic drugs, Mr. Chairman, and talking about giving someone civil monetary uh, penalty rights, uh, even wearing guns, uh, putting in video cam uh, cameras. And uh, I think uh, I think that uh, it's important to read into the to the record uh, Mr. Cusero's appearance with Chris Wallace uh, uh, when uh, they pointed up that we had some doctors who still practice in the poor sections of New York City, and when Medicaid uh, auditors uh, reviewed a small sample of some of the cases, uh, uh, they moved to kick them out of the Medicare and Medicaid program. And I'll be very brief, but before I ask Dr. Cusero the question that I want to ask him, uh, let me uh, go to some of the questions here to where uh, in, in that hearing, uh, Chris Wallace said, there are other signs of pressure to make cases against health care providers, including accusations that Inspector General Cusero's office has been running a bounty system. Why was the salary of one of your top assistants <coughs> James Patton, <coughs> excuse me, Mr. Chairman, who would, why was his salary directly tied to the number of cases he made and the amount of money he brought in? Cousero says that's not true. Mr. Wallace says this is his merit pay review. Mr. Cousero said let's take a look at it. Wallace said James Patton makes the final decision in many cases on whether a doctor is expelled from Medicare and how much he is fined. Copies of Patton's job performance uh, reports outlined by Prime Time showed that to get a pay raise, the number of sanctions against health care providers must be increased by 10% from its previous year, and the amount of fines must total at least $12 million. If Patton exceeded those targets by 10%, he got an even bigger raise. Why are these words in here? That question was asked of the Inspector General. Cousero said what it means is that this employee isn't in their pay system. He's a manager. Chris Wallace, and these are some of the factors in deciding whether or not he gets a pay increase. True or false? Cousero, it's 40% of the plan. Wallace, true or false? This is how hard, Mr. Chairman, it is to get an answer out of him, an honest answer. Cousero, yes. Wallace, so in fact it is tied to his merit plan. Cousero, indirectly. Well, why isn't it in there, Mr. Wallace asked. Cousero says, well, it should be. I took it out which was another untruth, Mr. Chairman. As Mr. Wallace pointed out, he took it out all right, but only after his office was sued. A federal judge ruled three months ago the merit plan was illegal and ordered Cousero to take it out. And the words were spoken, if there's one example of how devastating government action can be to a physician. It's a case of a New York country doctor, William Diefenbach. To the people of Southampton, Bill Diefenbach was a doctor from the old school who still made house calls and greeted his patients with a kiss. 32 years in the same town, no complaints, not a single malpractice suit. But then Dr. Diefenbach's files at Southampton Hospital were reviewed by a Medicaid Peer Review Organization, or PRO. Inspector General Cousero was telling these groups to make more cases against doctors or face a possible cut in funding. Quote, this is a critical part of your responsibilities, and your record in this area will, of course, be part of the PRO evaluation process, a threat by Mr. Cousero to his own people. Dr. Robert Fear uh, was head of the medical staff at Southampton Hospital and a longtime colleague of Dr. Diefenbach. Chris Wallace said, what did you think when you heard of the government going after him? Dr. Fear, we were absolutely amazed that we were convinced that they had the wrong person. They couldn't possibly be talking about Bill Diefenbach. Wallace went on to say none of the doctor's files were singled, nine of the doctor's files were singled out. And Mr. Chairman, Mr. Cousero said, but there was evidence in a number of cases that he was an impaired physician. He was suffering from drug abuse, and as a result of that, he was considered unwilling or unable to change his practice. Wallace, the Mr. Cousero said drug abuse, Cousero, yes. Wallace, where? I mean, I must say he was never charged with that. Mr. Cousero said this person was providing second-class medicine. He did not belong in the program. Wallace, the only reason I ask 
and we will go back and check it if there's evidence of drug abuse, is because we're absolutely unaware of it. Mr. Cusero, jam it down my throat, jam it down my throat. This is on national television, Mr. Chairman. Chris Wallace, we went back to check, asking Dr. Fear about the Inspector General's stunning charge. Fear said we have absolutely not a shred of evidence of any impairment for any reason, whether it be from prescription drugs, illicit drugs, alcohol, and there's no way that he could justify being thrown out of the Medicare program. So they may have had to come up with some other issue. Wallace, what you're saying is that they made it up. Fear, it certainly sounds like it to me. And Dr. Fair was an associate <coughs> of the doctor that was accused. Chris Wallace said the inspector general says that one reason your husband was kicked out of the government programs was because he was an impaired doctor because he had a drug problem. Diefenbach, the wife of the doctor, said, are you serious? He said that. That's the wife of the late doctor at that time, Mr. Chairman. He said that. That man is. It's a total, complete, utter, devastating lie. He had better pr have proof of that. And Mr. Wallace on prime time said, prime time asked to see the inspector general's proof. A week later, Cusero issued this statement. He still claimed Bill Diefenbach was a bad doctor, but said, after examining the official file, I must retract my official sta original statement about Dr. Diefenbach being drug impaired. The issue of drug use played no role whatsoever. Cusero declined to do another interview. But Dr. Bill Diefenbach gave up the fight to clear his name, his family says. From the day he was blackballed from Medicare, he sank slowly into a deep depression from which he never recovered. Three months ago, he shot and killed himself. Last month, a memorial service was held on the grounds of Southampton Hospital, where Dr. Diefenbach had practiced medicine for more than 20 years. Mrs. Diefenbach, the widow, said he was a healer, and he was a physician, and he was that first. And when you hit somebody in the heart, I think that's where his depression began. Chris Wallace, you believe that this case, the government's action against him, caused your husband to eventually take his life? This late widow answered, I believe that to the core. And Diane Sawyer concluded by saying, no one can say exactly how many doctors have been wrongly accused or prosecuted, but we found cases throughout the country in both state and federal programs, and one consequence of this is that more and more doctors are refusing to treat Medicare and Medicaid patients because the regulations are so confusing and the doctors are afraid of prosecution. My question to you, Mr. Inspector General, <coughs> is are you that same uh, Dr. Cusero who was on that program? Uh, no, sir. I don't have a doctorate anywhere, either a PhD or a medical. And you're not much of an Inspector degree. General. Are you the same Inspector General, sir? That's, it was on that interview, yes, sir. Yes, sure you were. Yes, and sir. you made those statements, and the statements were lies, weren't they, sir? I made a mistake uh, with regards to the elements as to the uh, impairment, uh, which was not part of the record. Dr. Diefenbach was uh, reviewed, as you mentioned, by a peer review organization. Twenty-three board-certified physicians in the state of New York had recommended to us that he should be permanently uh, barred from participation in Medicare, we mitigated it to five years. But you're the one that gave him the testimony about drug abuse, which you pulled out of midair. No, sir, I did not pull out of midair. I was misinformed. Well, you retracted it. Were you lying when you retracted it or when you gave the testimony? Well, I was misinformed when I made that statement. I corrected it uh, uh, within um, uh, the next day. Uh, and then, unfortunately, the uh, primetime uh, crew, having that in their hand, uh, proceeded to uh, uh, interview the um, uh, the widow and went through all that other stuff to build um, uh, the concluding case, which I thought was unnecessary since they already had information that I had corrected uh, the record. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted that in the record to address uh, the arrogant behavior that the doctor testified about. And I thank the chair. The, uh, chair recognizes. Thank the gentleman from Texas. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Eckert. Mr. Cursor, I have a, a couple of questions for you, if I may. Um, in July of 91, your office released a report on FDA's drug master file reviews. Could you explain what a DMF is and why its review is important to the generic drug approval process? The uh, drug master file uh, really summarizes all the significant steps in the manufacturing control uh, of the drug's active ingredient or the, the finished product. Uh, 
Because the firm uh, applying to FDA for generic um, drug approval and the ingredient manufacturer are generally not the same company, the generic drug application will not contain the confidential manufacturing information. However, the applicant firm will make reference uh, uh, in the generic drug application to the manufacturer's drug master file, which was submitted to FDA, and then FDA then can re review that, uh, and it helps them to ensure that the drug's uh, ingredients are safe and effective. What did your agency find uh, in your evaluation of the FDA's DMF uh, reviews? Was the agency wow. conducting these rather critical reviews? These, in fact, we, we felt that these were, in fact, uh, critical um, uh, reviews. It was a, a, a tremendous aid, if you will, to uh, the chemists to give them an idea as to uh, the safety as well as give an indication of efficacy of, of the drugs under application. We did find that the FDA did not have uh, the procedure requirements that really uh, laid out when the uh, drug master file review was needed and how uh, the drug manufacturer file review uh, should be conducted. There was no really standard operating procedure with regards to that. We know that there were instances where drug master uh, files were not reviewed. Uh, however, uh, since that uh, FDA lacked the uh, procedural requirements uh, for the reviewers uh, to look at it, uh, we could not determine the extent to which chemists uh, did in fact fail to uh, refer to them. So there was a hole in this critical safety net by the failure of the FDA to effectively manage the, uh, the DMF uh, process? Generally speaking, that's correct. Uh, was the uh, FDA management aware of these failures? They became uh, aware of it uh, in the latter part of 1988. Uh, we had determined that the FDA's Deputy Director in the Office of Drug Standards and the Center for uh, Drug Evaluation and Research became aware of it in November 1988 that uh, the drug chemists were in fact not reviewing the drug master file. Uh, the uh, officials uh, then advised the director of the Division of Drug, um, Generic Drugs of the situation, and both offices maintained that they did not disclose the problems to, uh, to senior management of the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research uh, or personnel within um, uh, the FDA's commissioner's office prior uh, to December 1988. Now the reason that that is a significant date is that was when uh, uh, the task force that was reporting uh, to the commissioner uh, was able was saying that uh, the generic drug review process uh, was basically sound. So basically uh, the withholding of that information, uh, um, if they had not withheld it, perhaps it would have changed the, uh, uh, the task force report to the commissioner. They did, however, raise it up by April 28, 1989, uh, and it became known. In November 1990, the Office of Inspector General issued a report disclosing that the FDA had failed to follow up on the inspection of a device manufacturer by the name of National Medical Care, which revealed some serious problems with its hemoperfusion device used to cleanse blood, as well as the firm's failure to report these problems to the FDA. Your inspection, uh, your audit, found that the, the follow-up inspection was not conducted. It fell through the cracks of the FDA. What, if anything, to your knowledge, has the FDA done to ensure that the problems with NMC have been addressed? <coughs> Excuse me. Subsequently, when it was brought to their attention, they did uh, take action to um, uh, bar uh, the uh, importing of these uh, uh, devices. It is in now um, uh, placed in limbo while they evaluate uh, the full effects of it. We have a follow-up review that's uh, scheduled to start this November to see what the final outcome of those steps uh, uh, were. You discussed in your testimonies the problems that uh, uh, the FDA has had <coughs> uh, with uh, conducting low-risk food safety inspections. Since they are by definition low risk, why is the FDA not properly devoting their attention to higher risk food safety questions? Well, I think, I think that they are, and I think that is one of the reasons why uh, the low risk food safety area has uh, been thinned out. There's been a decline in the amount of inspections in that arena, and, and that's precisely because of the fact that they have been reallocating resources uh, to the higher priority areas. Uh, as we looked at that, you know, we cannot find fault with that. You certainly uh, want FDA to be out there looking at the uh, uh, life-threatening type of um, a risk that may be there for the public, uh, and the lower risk area should take the uh, back burner. The question that uh, we had and what we've been exploring with um, uh, FDA has been maybe that FDA could be put more in an oversight role 
and that uh, a lot of the um, uh, plant inspections or bottling inspections and things like that might be more appropriate at the uh, state level with FDA setting the uh, guidelines and the um, uh, standards and then ch checking on to see how that is working and that might be a more effective uh, uh, use of their resources. That would greatly limit the need for manpower in that arena and it would allow for further redirecting of resources into the higher risk areas. So we're having a lot of discussions with them and I think uh, probably somewhere down the road we might want to come back to uh, Congress and discuss it with, uh, with Congress because that it would need, uh, we would need to have um, a congressional assistance should, be, should that be the pathway that, uh, uh, that uh, people might want to follow. In your uh, testimony you also mentioned very briefly some problems with drug promotions by certain pharmaceutical manufacturers. What are some of these drug promotion practices that disturb you? One of which is what Dr. Kessler had referred where he is moving very aggressively and that's misleading advertising to, uh, to the public. Uh, the, but I think you'd also say misleading advertising also uh, to the physician community. Oftentimes in um, professional journals, uh, information of, of not an entirely accurate nature is uh, portrayed to the physician as to what the product can do and uh, that probably warrants some additional attention. Also, uh, payments for physicians involved in studies. Uh, sometimes the studies are a warrant payment, other times it's an artifice that's created uh, whereby uh, the uh, drug company will pay physicians for every patient that they prescribe and report on and it becomes an artifice for which they can um, uh, induce them to get more patients on their particular drug. That probably warrants uh, some uh, examination. Uh, oftentimes also other inducements might practice yes it is it's it's very prevalent as a matter of fact it's also uh, prevalent where whereby uh, uh, drunk companies uh, might uh, uh, provide uh, payments uh, in cash or kind uh, for speaking engagements which in fact are really uh, oftentimes uh, not a substantive type arrangement but an artifice once again to disguise a uh, transfer of, uh, of payment uh, there are sometimes inducements uh, that uh, cross the line with regards uh, to uh, payments for uh, physicians attending uh, educational pro promotional programs which are in nice exotic areas uh, where oftentimes uh, that the only educational uh, part of the, of the program is a high-pitched sales effort by uh, drug companies. And sometimes you have unsolicited uh, gifts or other promotional items that will pass to, to physicians, hopefully to induce the physician to uh, use a particular uh, uh, drug product. Would you characterize one of the, the, this kind of uh, the first artifice that you were talking about in, in which uh, physicians prescribe? Is this kind of like a, a frequent prescriber program? It, it, it can be. It can be uh, just that, is that is that uh, it can be legitimate or, again, when you have an artifice, usually what you try to do is disguise it to make it look uh, like it is a, uh, a, uh, a legitimate research effort when, in fact, it's basically saying we will pay you so much for every patient you report on that you prescribe on this, um, uh, on this particular drug of ours. Uh, sometimes you have to get behind it and take a look at actually what they're doing with the information that's being received in. Is it actually being used for research material uh, to assist the uh, pharmaceutical company in the development or improvement of the drug or evaluating the drug or is this part of the commercial uh, efforts of the drug company and it's thrown into a circular file not really acted upon. So oftentimes uh, you really can't tell on the face of it whether it's an untoward uh, act to attempt to uh, influence a physician improperly or whether it's a real legitimate uh, research effort, uh, but it is, those are prevalent practices. Sounds like the kind of thing that uh, is too good to be true, and if it is, it's probably not worthwhile being there. Uh, Dr. Kessler, let me direct my attention uh, uh, to you, if I may. It's my understanding that in 1990, you announced that uh, we would be hiring a, about 100 uh, Series 1811 investigators to conduct criminal investigations. Uh, what is the current status of the hiring of these additional investigators? Those uh, uh, hundred criminal investigators uh, have been approved um, throughout the system, um, throughout the department. Um, I, they are they've recently uh, they've been signed by the secretary, um, recently sent to the Office of Personnel Management, uh, and at my request. Uh, we have asked, <coughs> excuse me, for expedited review 
um, so we can go and hire those uh, 100 people. Hired, uh, hired anyone since your announcement in 1990 that you were going to? We, are, we have been moving ahead, moving the personnel system, um, and we should be ready to advertise uh, as soon as the, it is signed by OPM. Uh, who's the head of the uh, Office of Director of Office of Criminal Investigations? Uh, within the agency? Until we can advertise, until the positions are signed off, I can't advertise. So you're waiting on a job description to be approved? Or you're waiting on... <coughs> I'm waiting on a whole series of job descriptions uh, to be approved. Our, our plan uh, that, we, that we're planning to put into effect is to, uh, as soon as all the positions are approved, uh, the package is approved, there's one package. Uh, we hire the, the director, uh, allow that director uh, to hire six regional directors, um, and then hire um, the investigators. Is this uh, year or so delay uh, unusual in the fulfilling of position, filling of positions such as this? C Congressman, I, I thought when I came to the agency, I said that I wanted to put into place a new management team, um, leave aside the criminal investigators that, that I've always wanted to. And I, I come from uh, the not-for-profit uh, sector, and I said, okay, I, I figured three months. Um, I'm only beginning uh, to have in place. I, I'm, I'm happy to announce that uh, we have three new senior m members of the management team, but they're only joining the agency. It takes a long time. I would have never thought, uh, I never comprehended how long uh, a time it takes uh, to do things and to do it right. Um, and uh, it's taken a long time, but I am very committed. Um, we're moving expeditiously. Uh, as expeditiously as we can, uh, with uh, making sure that we uh, follow all the personnel constraints. What are those personnel constraints? Is it the GS level that gets assigned? Is there, it there, there, there are a whole host. We, we, we were carving some new ground, Congressman, uh, because, and I can let Mr. Chesmore talk a little about the, the issue, uh, but one of the issues, we've never had 20-year retirement uh, within the agency. Uh, that was a whole new policy. Uh, because we, uh, if you're going to be able to attract good criminal investigators, you have to give that as part of the package. That was new to us. Uh, there were those kind of policy issues. Is, uh, is there any concern about the structure that you've created for this director that uh, that person will, will in effect be reporting to an assistant or I guess it's associate commissioner as a, who, who is not uh, primarily functioned uh, of criminal investigations as opposed to an enforcement as opposed to reporting directly to you. you. What you have said publicly about enforcement I think has been well received by many in the committee, uh, but I guess there is the possibility, Doctor, that the impression is, is that you've created a position uh, that reports to somebody further down the line and that there's less of an emphasis or interest in, maybe, in enforcement. Um, make no mistake about it. The, uh, the gentleman sitting next to me, Mr. Chesmore, is the chief enforcement officer for the agency. Uh, we have many uh, enforcement officials. What we're talking about is a cadre of specially trained criminal investigators. Uh, they will report to, to Mr. Chesmore. They, have, uh, they will know they have access to me. Um, I spend a lot of time in the enforcement area. I, I meet regularly on enforcement issues. I think that we have to uh, have an organization that works. We have to have a, uh, a chain of command. We can't simply uh, have everybody reporting. The, there has to be an appropriate, uh, appropriate responsibilities and authorities. I have every confidence that Mr. Chesmore, if an issue needs to be elevated to me, uh, will elevate it. Uh, and if there's a problem and the system doesn't work, um, and they need to report to me, and that becomes uh, evident. We will fix the situ uh, We will fix the problem. GS15 appropriate for these investigators? The kind of people that you need and want to uh, to do the kind of work that needs to be done. Not bad. Congressman, we certainly uh, believe that we should get uh, the highest position that we can. And that's uh, for the director, correct? The GS15. That would be the office director. Uh, at this time, the GS-15 is the, is the position of, of record that we're recruiting for. We believe, uh, after talking to other people in this area, including uh, folks from 
Mr. Cusero staff and other agencies that there are people who can compete for this position who have experience. Uh, certainly uh, we want the highest grade that we can get right now. That's the 15 and we, we want to get this program in place and, and get on with it. What would uh, prevent you from making the director an SES position? SES positions are at a scarcity in the in the federal government, certainly in the department and at the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, we certainly have more need for SES positions, I think it's fair to say, than right now we have uh, added slots. So there is that factor. That's a major concern. Dr. Kessler, let me come back to you if I may. What is the plan grade structure of the 1811s that the agency plans to hire? Maybe <coughs> Mr. Chesmore can answer it. I they range from... They, they range from 15 down to 5. This is a career ladder, uh, professional position within the uh, Office of Personnel Management. And is my understanding, I mean, when I ask the question, it is a similar range to the way the FBI sets up their, their range of uh, officials? That, with respect to two special agents in charge in the field, GS 13s, 14s, but that's certainly what we want to have. We want to have as high a grade as possible, but this is a career ladder professional position. We anticipate recruiting many people from other agencies who are already experienced in this area. We've gotten a lot of interest from folks in other agencies who have indicated they want to come and work for the Food and Drug Administration. They're experienced 1811s. We hope to hire them at the GS 12, 13 level. We're certainly not wanting to hire a lot of new people right out of school. Yeah, that raises a whole serious question about having to supervise and train new people at the lower level. And I understand you want to build them, build them up and what your dollar limits are, but bringing in five, sevens, and nines that you have to supervise and train and, and regimentize and, and get, get in, in, into the flow of investigative work is uh, having been a former assistant prosecutor myself, I knew I could have hired uh, any one of a hundred people to be one of my investigators, the question is, could I hire the right one and a good one exactly. Exactly. to, uh, to yes, get sir. the job done? And, and it seems to me that at some of these levels, you might get some real eager beaver, but boy, oh boy, you're going to have to spend a heck of a lot of time getting them up to speed on something that is not, you know, this is not, uh, this is not your typical uh, B&E. This is a serious, uh, a serious crime. That, it that it, it is very serious, Congressman. Uh, we were, uh, we got some good, very good news yesterday. The executive board of the uh, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia, voted unanimously that the Food and Drug Administration should be a participating member at Glencoe, which automatically means then that our employees will have training available to them there. That's good news. It is very good news. The, uh, the six regions that you're going to be, uh, 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 that's where the investigative staff will be located? Yes, sir. In the field for the most part. And, and the, they will have an individual supervisor in each of these regions? Yes. And then those regions will report directly, I assume, to you, Mr. Chesmore? No, they will report to the director of the Office of Criminal Investigations at headquarters, who then will report to me. So we have 1811 supervising 1811s. I am not an 1811 myself. Uh, however, I am uh, going to Glencoe on Sunday uh, to receive a couple of weeks of training in this area. <laughs> Looking has uh, to that. has o OPM is the Office of Personnel Manager? Have they approved the uh, uh, the, the director's position? That they have not yet, sir. They we have asked them to expedite the approval. Do we know what the problem is there? The, the, I don't believe there is a problem, Congressman. I think they are. We've asked them to expedite it, and then, um, just for, you should know they just got it, so they are acting expeditiously. One more question, Mr. Chairman, and I'm sorry to dwell on things that may seem mundane, but. Uh, claims that there are more cops on the beat and, and actually putting them on the beat, that, that, that's very important. To say you want to enforce the law is good, but to know that there are people there to make that happen is important. The last question I have, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the Chair's indulgence. Dr. Kessler, could you please advise this committee as to what will be the, the high priority areas, the, the areas of focus and attention uh, that these uh, new investigators uh, will, will be focusing on? There will be uh devoted to criminal fraud uh, and criminal violation of the statute. Anti-tampering, will that be included in that? I think that you're going to, uh, certainly anti-tampering, but uh, the Prescription Drug Marketing Act, uh, I think that uh, false statements, uh, uh, counterfeit uh, drugs, uh, we can keep a hundred investigators very busy. Well, it's real important that those hundred folks get out there because the uh, the threat of prosecution, as you know, and investigation is is 
is as much a deterrent as to the actual investigation and prosecution itself. Uh, and uh, I look forward to the timely completion of those uh, promised hirings. And Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your forbearance and yield back the balance. Time the gentleman has expired. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions. Dr. Kessler, I've been looking with considerable interest and it's remarkable what a fellow finds when he reads newspapers in this town. Sometimes useful thing. Legal Times, September 2, 1991. Shaw Pittman's inside job. Hired for FDA parenthesis, or rather, quote, integrity, close quote, review. Firm also has food and drug clients. I'm going to read the article here a little bit for the benefit of both of us so you won't be surprised when I ask a question about it. At a time when many Washington law firms are bolstering their practices to cash in on Food and Drug Administration's regulatory zeal, one firm has found a surefire way to gain access to agency officials, comb confidential files, and otherwise position itself above the competition, all at the taxpayer's expense. D.C.'s Shaw, Pittman, Potts, and Trowbridge has landed a $710,558 contract with FDA to conduct what the agency calls an, quote, integrity review, close quote, of its internal operations. The goal? Restoring credibility to an agency that has been stung by scandal in recent years. The contract, along with another focusing on insider trading, apparently marks the first time that FDA has veered outside the bounds of its inspector general's office on its or its numerous advisory committees for an internal review. It's an arrangement that troubles those who generally oppose enlisting contractors for sensitive government audits. And the selection of Shaw, Pittman, which lobbies for NutraSweet, RGR, Nabisco, Washington, Inc., and other food and drug companies regulated by, and other food and drug companies regulated by the FDA has raised questions about conflict of interest. That's an obvious conflict of interest that should have been carefully reviewed by FDA officials, said a spokesman for Senator David Pryor, Democrat, Arkansas, whose Senate subcommittee investigates improprieties in federal contracting. It gives them insider information. Think about the access they'll have. The law, the law firm has thought about, frankly, has thought, has thought about it. J. Thomas Leonard, a Shaw Pittman partner who works on the FDA project, acknowledges that the experience will give the firm a boost in developing food and drug litigation process, uh, practice. We view this as an opportunity to do something that is frankly professionally rewarding, says Leonard. Obviously, it gives us a chance to learn more about a substantial area of legal work. We hope that it may well open up new professional opportunities in the future. Some experts view Leonard's remarks as something of an understatement. Uh, it goes on to say, amongst other factors that helped the firm land the award is the participation of Rhinelander, who in the 70s served as general counsel the Department of Health, Education, Welfare, the precursor of the Department of Health and Human Services. Now, it does seem that it's going, this is going to be a rewarding opportunity. It says they're going to be able to go through the files down at FDA, learn about FDA practices, learn about uh, how FDA functions, shape the practices of FDA with regard to integrity and policy, with regard to uh, enforcement of food and drug laws, and perhaps to, to build a practice. It even says that, uh, it says, the article goes on to say that, that uh, this particular law firm uh, uh, has a number of FDA clients, uh, and it uh, has founded a new lobby coalition, the Workplace Health and Safety Council. So they're going to be out lobbying on health questions. I'm curious, how do you justify this particular selection of somebody who has other interests than, than your consumer-oriented interests to carry out this kind of responsibility? Let, let me step back, uh, Congressman, and tell you what the intent was and, and where we are. Sure, the intention was good, but, well, let me, but let me, let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about the consequences, which appear to be somewhat mischievous. Fine, let, 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 let me just put it in, in, in a little context. I recognize that I, as commissioner, have to take responsibility to ensure the integrity of our decision making. 
Uh, we have help. We have help from the IG. We have help from the GAO. We have help from congressional oversight. But I can't wait. I have an obligation um, to be part of the discovery process. This committee has spent time looking at one I mean, absolutely critical element where we fell down uh, in generic drugs. But w when I came in and, and, and recognized that we have 50, 60, 70 different application processes, how do we ensure the integrity? And, and how do I, Kessler, make sure that we're part of that discovery process? So we, we went about and decided to do it from a multifaceted point of view. The, the, the first, I first tried to bring somebody on full time um, to work with us to shore up processes. It's the IG's responsibility um, to look at specific cases. But when, when looking about management um, and improving our own processes, we have a responsibility uh, in that area. So I, I tried to, I, I was thinking about bringing someone on as a special counsel full, full time for a year. That didn't pan out. I then went to the administrative conference of the United States. I said, could you help us so you can ha we can have a fresh look and uh, help us put some of these things into effect. Um, and, and, and they didn't have the expertise uh, in their opinion. So I said, let's go and let's bid this. Um, and then a formal bid process um, was put in place. On that uh, advisor, on the, the program selection committee, uh, 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 the program advisory committee, was the special counsel for ethics. Um, he, he served on it. Maybe we better take a look at your special counsel for ethics. Well, I, I think that, and let me, if I may, Mr. Chairman, have Ms. Pendergast tell you, I think that uh, we tried very hard to put into effect to make sure that uh, there would not be conflicts or not perceived conflicts. And I don't think the story is fully accurate. If, if, if she can, if, if Ms. Pendergast can just uh, tell you, Mr. Chairman, uh, about the, the conflicts, uh, the, the, about what steps we took, I think, that, uh, I think that's important to be on the record. Well, I'll tell you, before we, before we hear from Ms. Pendergast, we've got to put her under oath. But, 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 but while we're talking about this, why don't we just direct our, our, ourselves to the, to the statement that was made by J. Thomas Leonard. He said, we view this as an opportunity to do something that is frankly professionally rewarding. He goes on to say this, obviously it gives us a chance to learn about a substantial area of legal work. We hope it may well open new professional opportunities in the future. Now, if I were to, if I were to announce that we're going to investigate food and drugs so, it'll, so it will open up new professional opportunities for members of this committee, or so that it will open up new political opportunities for the chairman of this subcommittee, I think the Ethics Committee would be on me like a duck on a June bug. And the press sitting over there would, would, would be out for my hide. Now, here, don't, don't, don't take what Dingle's saying. Let's just listen to Mr. Leonard. He says that we hope it may well open new professional opportunities in the future. This is a far-sighted fella. And, and, and he appears to have the idea that, 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 that he's going to get some new opportunities. He's going to draw and, and, the ethics rules. He's going to make all kind of contacts. He's going to be getting into the files and looking at papers. And he's going to have very productive time. He's going to get paid for this. Now, there's some people in the legal profession that think that they ought to pay for the privilege of doing this because it's going to be such a splendid I, I, opportunity to go into successful be, law practice. First of all, the, the issue, um, again, I don't know exactly what he said to the reporter, but assuming the statement is well, let's, correct, let's, I, it, 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 it's even more mind-boggling to me, Mr. Chairman, because I don't know how he gets there. Well, let's, we just, have, we have taken let's just take Mr. Leonard at his word. But, he said, it, right. we, we hope it may well open up new professional opportunities it, in the future. But he does not have, as I understand it, we have made sure he or no, any member of that team has any FDA, represents anyone in front of the FDA. Now, it is my understanding that well, there, uh, there is an agreement between him and the special counsel for ethics um, that uh, the, the principles of that agreement have been reached. Uh, whereby there are post-contract restrictions, they recuse themselves. Again, I don't have the details, Mr. Chairman, but I don't know how that statement makes sense in light of those uh, restrictions that the special counsel for ethics. If there is a problem, 
if, if, if this allows Mr. Lehard to go and look, if you do well in life on anything, it may translate into something. I, and there's, there's, it's very hard. Um, uh, I, I think that's a, that's a that, that's something we all live. But no one should trade on trade. Um, on the work they do for us. They have an ethical responsibility for us to be the client. Well, let's, let's, let's look at this business here. Were they ever inquired of as to who their clients were? A again, I think... Did, did anybody say, now, do you represent NutraSuite? Or do you represent RGO, R Nabisco? Uh, are you in the lobbying business? Uh, are, are, the, the answer you, is do yes. Do you have other clients who have business the, before the Food and Drug Administration? The, the, the answer is yes. They were asked to disclose their conflicts. Those discussions have taken place with the Special Counsel for Ethics. I am told that they, are, they have disclosed their legislative, uh, con those legislative conflicts that other people have, uh, not, not this do team. You, do you know that they, that they disclosed these, these other associations and interests they had before they got this contract? Again, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I have said I am told. I think Ms. Pendergast has seen the disclosure, uh, the disclosure forms. And I, I, I've been told that they have discussed those disclosures with the Special Counsel for Ethics. They, they In my discussion, I'm sorry. But you don't really know that. Again, I don't have primary knowledge of the conversation that took place between the uh, Special Counsel for Ethics and the well, firm. Were the, you, you mentioned a series of restrictions with regard to future employment. Uh, were those agreed to? Again, it is my understanding, uh, and I did speak to the Special Counsel for Ethics, that there is an agreement in principle uh, with regard to this. I'm not sure it's been reduced to writing, but there is an agreement in principle between the Special Counsel for Ethics and the firm. There's an agreement in principle. Does that mean an agreement which has been signed or, or an agreement which, which may be translated into a piece of paper which might become enforceable and binding at some future time? My understanding, again, is that when I spoke to the Special Counsel for Ethics, it was not yet reduced to writing, but there, were, there was an agreement in principle well, between the so, two. So if it's not been reduced to writing, it's not an agreement and it's not a contract. And it's not any constraint on them, is it? Um, again, I, I don't know what the legal... I mean, I, well, I would hope an well, agreement if, in principle if, between if, the two. If, 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 if it's not been signed, it's not an agreement. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and if you have an agreement to pay them $710,000 for certain work, that is an agreement, isn't it? Now, I'm just poor Polish lawyer. I'm trying hard to understand this thing, and I'm a little... And, 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 little and, and again, I, I, I need to let those who uh, have been involved in the process talk, because I don't have... I, 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 I can't tell you from first-hand knowledge well, exactly where that agreement is and what's the binding effect of that agreement. Well, who, who does know the answer to that? Mr. Chairman, I would be happy... I think that the, probably the best person who has primary knowledge of the agreement that can speak uh, for the government, I mean, is the special counsel for ethics. He's not here today. I would be happy to submit anything for the record. Ms. Pendergast, who works with me. Well, here, here, here this, this law firm is a part of a council uh, whose purpose uh, is defined as being created, quote, to lobby against reforms that would toughen the Occupational Safety and Health Act, which is up for reauthorization this year. Now, that's not a food and drug concern, but obviously it involves consumer safety, it involves exposure to, to dangerous substances, and, 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 and uh, this, this is a firm which, which goes out and formulates new councils, which are going to lobby, attract new business, and I'm, I'm trying to find out you apparently have a contract with them, pay them $710,000 to do work. You apparently are, 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 are negotiating with them now with regard to the constraints which you will impose upon them with regard to future behavior. Uh, you are told that there was some discussion of who their, who, of who their clients might be. Now, it, would I be unfair in inferring that perhaps NutraSuite might have occasional item of business before food and drug? NutraSuite certainly does have an occasional and item. Would I, would I be unfair in inferring that RGR Nabisco, which is one of the major food and, and uh, uh, consumer commodity producers, has, has occasional business before food and drug? That's correct. 
Now, how are we to be assured that all of these occasional items of businesses that just once in a while are going to appear before your agency are not going to uh, either affect or be affected by the new ethical actions which are going to be taken by food and drug under the very careful advice of this law firm. Mr. Chairman, we could go and find, again, once you make a decision to go to a bid, you, you find the best, uh, uh, the, best, uh, uh, per, the best bidder. The, what, what the, was wrong we with the other? We could, we could have found, okay, we could have found somebody who has no expertise. Uh, we could have found somebody who has no conflicts. We well, regulate 25% of, of, I mean, of the economy. It was very important that these people had no direct conflicts, that well, no one in the firm, to my knowledge, represents anyone in front of the agency. Law firms of this size, when you're dealing with 250 people, have procedures in place and there are ethical issues so that they can't use. We have locked rooms. I mean, to deal with this. We have special communication vehicles, so they're not allowed to talk to anyone. My understanding is they put their own personal uh, holdings into special kinds of arrangements. We've, tr we, we've gone to a bid process. I mean, we've, we have, we, I mean, we certainly don't want any conflicts and we don't want any appearance of conflicts. I think that when you're dealing with a firm with 250 people, it, it, there, there is no question. You could find somebody that represents. Well, let's 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 just let's just try and, and, and take a little look at it. Are they going to advise FDA on the substance of the law? Th their their job is to help us on looking and help us look at the processes that we whereby we sure uh, assure the so integrity got, of our decision making. So so their knowledge of food and drug law is not important to that. They're not going to be advising you about about uh, substance, are they? They're going to be, it's about assuring the integrity of our decision making okay. more than any substantive legal uh, aspect. Uh, is this, is, is food and drug, is their knowledge of food and drug law so specifically important that it, that it is a component of the uh, requirement for the work that they're going to be doing for you? It is important that they have not of uh, food and drug necessarily, but in this type of assuring the integrity um, and the way agencies go about dealing with data, that is more important. Well, I, I, I'm kind of, kind, of, kind of curious because it says, uh, here, here they, say, they say something which might give us some clue as to how they propose to deal with it. They say, obviously it gives us a chance to learn, a more, learn more about a substantial area of legal work. We hope it may well open up new professional opportunities in the future. Uh, I, I, I gather they intend to prosper from this, but I'm trying to find out if, if their food and drug practice is going to help them give you better advice. They're apparently going to advise you on things like integrity and questions of that sort. Uh, do, do they necessarily have to be experts on food and drug to advise you on, 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 on your processes and on, and on, and on integrity? They need to know how government agencies work. They need to know how to, to, improve, how to, to improve the controls um, on, on the decision-making process. A good, a good administrative, a rather good law firm with good administrative practice could do that work for you, couldn't they? Without bringing the conflict of all of these, of all of these interesting clients who, by the way, have a lot of business before you, and who will continue to do so. We were looking for the. To be we were represented by a firm that says it's a lobby. Absolutely, we were looking for the best law firm. We set it out to bid, Mr. Chairman. In, in, when I was running a hospital, you know, when I went to find lawyers, I didn't go out to bid. That's not the way we did well, business. We went out to bid here. We, we, we uh, there was a panel. There were special counsel for ethics was on the panel. They, they selected the best. They try to put into the, the controls. Again, if Ms. Pendergast about, can, can go through just, those. Doctor, how about just a good management consultant firm? Couldn't you have gotten one of them that wouldn't have had any substantive and lobbying interest? Uh, the, um, again, um, there was a, there, the bid was set out in such a way, the specs were set out, that it was thought that, that a knowledge of the legal issues involved uh, would be helpful. 
Um, again, it depends on who submitted you, bids. You, you've kind of told me that you didn't think it was helpful because they aren't going to advise you on the substance of these issues. They're going to advise you on, on how the issues, the, the, the issues referred to generically are, are dealt with by food and drug. Mr. Chairman, I mean, I, I couldn't, I mean, again, um, you know, I think, I mean, I, it's very hard to deal with anything with that agency. Everything we do has legal, um, uh, has legal over. I mean, I, it's very hard to deal with anything with that agency. Everything we do has legal, um, uh, has legal overtones. I mean, I, I, I didn't get this job. I wasn't asked to do this uh, simply because I'm a baby doctor. My legal training has a lot to do with my ability to understand the complexities of that agency. So it was thought that that legal, uh, that, that legal training would be, would be helpful. Well, a good, a good consultant firm could run out and get themselves legal advice as they needed or, or, or bring in an in-house counsel who didn't have any food. And, and they could submit a bid, and if they met the specs of the bid, uh, you know. Who were, the, who were the other bidders in this matter, and why did they get dumped? Again, Mr. Chairman, I have no primary knowledge uh, of that. I, I've read the article, I've heard, but I couldn't give you a whole list. Again, Ms. Pendergast could, perhaps. Well, I, I guess we're just going to have to send the watchbirds out and have them do a little interviewing down there to sort of help give us appreciation of what's going on here. Because, quite honestly, it, it reminds me of a story that, that, that of what happened to us at a time past. We had a situation here where, where we had a, an operation which was uh, in the arbitrage and in the merger business. And they said, my word. We have a perfect separation here. And I said, that's very interesting. How, how do you have this perfect separation? Well, we've, we've separated the arbitrage and the, and the merger business so that they are completely distinct. I said, well, that's very fine. Who heads them? Oh, the same fella heads them both. They said, but we've got a Chinese wall. And I said, yeah, it starts at the bridge of his nose and runs right down through his navel. And it, the, the thought occurs to me, we may have a similar situation going on here. The time the chair has expired, the gentleman from the, the gentleman from... from can, Mr. Chairman, can I, can I just respond, one, if, if I may? Pardon? Can I just respond? Sure. Uh, if there are, I mean, we've asked, um, I've asked Sharon Holston to speak to Charles Maddox of Mr. Kusro's staff. We've asked them to review, because, I mean, Chinese walls also, I am dubious of. If there are conflicts, or there are appearances of conflicts that have not been resolved, and those are pointed out, and, and those are in fact true, we will act on it. Well, you've already signed the contract, Doctor. If, there's a, if, there, if there are conflicts that we were not aware about, if there are appearances that were not, if there were systems not in place to adequately take care of it, I, I mean, it may be expensive getting out of it, but I'm not aware of any conflicts now, okay, that would justify that, but if, if they come to light, uh, we will take action. Thank you. Gentleman from, gentleman from Texas. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kessler, I, I think uh, the general feeling of the committee and particularly of the health subcommittee, and I think you've appeared before them uh, previously uh, this year before Mr. Uh, Chairman Waxman. Is that correct? I have appeared before yeah. Chairman Waxman. Uh, I think our feeling, and certainly I share that feeling of the job you're doing is one of, uh, I guess, cautious comfort uh, in the credentials that you bring and, and as forthright as you've been with us. But you remember you came before that committee and, and testified, I think, regarding Chairman Waxman's proposed new authority, uh, that you didn't, uh, you didn't reach for that authority is the feeling I got from it. You didn't really give us a real answer as to what authority you wanted. And that's uh, perhaps legitimate because as I understand it, up to this time, the administration really hasn't made up its mind as to what part of this bill that they want to support. That's correct, isn't it? That's correct, sir. So I, I understand that. Uh, and the system that you inherited has been described as a, as a chaotic system. Uh, I think they use the word second-guessing and delays uh, uh, and fear of responsibility. Uh, I guess my only question to you is, uh, when you go to the chairman's opening statements here when he pointed out uh, that your ultimate success would be 
uh, to the extent that you could develop an efficient uh, program and an accountable uh, enforcement process uh, and whether or not you can have the HHS control lawyers serve the FDA rather than vice versa and whether or not you can direct and motivate an off reluctant bureaucracy and I'm, I'm quoting Chairman Dingell and whether or not you can reform and re-energize the generic drug approval process and improve the regulation of medical devices and accelerate the reforms that are already underway in other areas. Uh, I think that's, I think it'd be too much of a question to ask you to answer right now at the end of your testimony when apparently there's another uh, committee to come before us, another group. But could you give me the benefit of your answers on this and point out to me uh, the real bedrock of the bill that you all want when you make your mind up and uh, where you've been hampered by a lack of legislative authority to this time. W would you do that? I, I, I would be happy to, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Congressman. Thank you. I'll yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank the gentleman from Texas. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Decker. Thank the Chairman. Uh, Mr. Astrew, uh, it's uh, your turn in the barrel. Uh, I have Exhibit B, which I would like to make as uh, part of the, uh, the committee record, and if the staff will provide the witness with a copy of it, it is a chronology of the implementation of the approval of Title I of the Waxman Hatch Act, which began in March of 1985. Do you have a copy of the chronology, Mr. Astrew? Would the uh, committee staff please provide? No, uh, no, I don't, sir. You're either going to be on famous, uh, famous talking on the phone or Mr. Astor, the reason I'm over here is that I have reduced Exhibit B to these charts that are behind me on the wall. And uh, I sometimes discover that uh, a physical demonstration such as this makes the point that I want to, that I want to make here. As, as you can tell, the uh, Office of General Counsel has had a significant role at each step of the implementation of the Waxman-Hatch uh, Act, which uh, Congress concluded work on in, in 1984. The black on the chart reflects actions of the agency. But at each place on these charts, you can see there are significant portions of the chart in red, which reference the Office of General Counsel's involvement in the rules uh, implementing that uh, uh, that law. My concern is, and it's, it's key to one of the recommendations of the, uh, of the Edwards Commission, uh, and that is the level of involvement of your office, <coughs> some would characterize it as delay here, uh, in the promulgation ultimately uh, 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 of those rules. Can you justify, can you explain OGC's role here that has, that has resulted in, in such significant delay uh, uh, that's reflected on the charts behind me? Well, first of all, let me say I'm a little bit of a disadvantage. I haven't had a chance to review this chart, and I, in fact, I can't see that uh, well enough to, to read it from here. Um, but I can comment generally, um, and then perhaps Ms. Porter can comment with more uh, specificity. Um, the department, as my understanding, issues about one regulation uh, every uh, uh, working day, and that doesn't include the regulations that the FDA has delegated authority to promulgate. And the, the vast majority of the uh, regulations um, uh, that the FDA promulgates, um, they have delegated authority to, to issue. Um, they're reviewed by the FDA division um, in Rockville, but they don't, for instance, go through my immediate office. Um, only those regulations that the secretary reviews does my immediate office uh, review. Um, for FDA regulations, for healthcare financing regulations, the statutes are enormously complex. And in many of um, uh, our areas, the, the case law interpreting those statutes is very complex. The, um, uh, at the time that we were um, proceeding initially on the labeling regulations, we, we didn't, did not have legislation. And a lot of the, the work that went into it was predicated on trying to craft a regulation 
that would um, uh, be legally defensible uh, without having as precise and, and clear a, um, uh, a guidance from the Congress as we now have. Um, all those uh, types of considerations that go into to rulemaking um, require a fair amount of legal uh, analysis and expertise. Um, and again, while I have not had a chance to review this chart, um, it is not atypical for Office of General Counsel um, in, in uh, uh, any division in this department and, and Office of General Counsel um, uh, offices and other agencies to have a fairly um, intense involvement with the rulemaking because quite frankly it doesn't do any good to come out with a regulation that's not well crafted um, and we turn around and we, we, we lose you know years of effort in the courts. We've got I've got 35,000 cases in federal court um, that I'm responsible for. A relatively small percentage of those are FDA cases. But quite frankly, every time a regulation gets invalidated for not having, not being consistent with the legislative uh, uh, authority, um, it's a substantial blow um, to the, the agency. So spending some time up front to make sure that our regulations are well crafted, um, that they'll do well in court, and in general, uh, I think the statistics bear out that we're doing much better uh, in recent years in defending our regulations and making sure that they do stand up. I think some time invested in the process to make sure that we've got a good product is well worthwhile. And again, I, you know, I, I can't make judge. I can see the red and the black from here, and, and I, I don't, can't read the dates. Um, but um, you know, it doesn't seem to me that the amount of red that's up there is necessarily uh, well, it's a little bit like watching a Jimmy Connors tennis match. I mean, it's, it, it, what, what you're saying is that, it, and, and if you review this, and, and I'm not picking on you except to draw by example the fact that a rulemaking process is a constant process, apparently, of going back and forth, back and forth. And while it may be exciting to watch it at the U.S. Open, uh, it leaves somewhat uh, significant uh, shortfall for us of, of failing to see an, 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 an end result in any kind of, in, in any kind of way. It, my, concern, my concern, I guess, is, is somewhat reflective a little bit of what the chairman was. Of, of, of was. How many in your staff, in, in your office, uh, have, have left positions uh, with OGC for law firms who, who practice the, the in food and drug issues? Well, traditionally, there's been a, uh, a, a relatively steady trickle. It is, it is a place where uh, clearly there are uh, many advantages to credentialing oneself in the division, and there's a longstanding tradition of um, uh, lawyers interested in food and drug law starting their career in the division, going uh, out to private practice and coming back. Uh, as chief counsel, I don't think I can I can stop that. We, you know, I, my, I'm not asking you to stop right. it. I guess but, that's but, one but of the let points. Me say, I, I let me say, let, 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 but I do want to talk about the revolving door aspect because I, I think that we've done some things here that I want the the committee to know about. Um, you know, we can indenture our our lawyers to the office, and we start them at thirty-one thousand dollars a year last year, and and even with the pay increase, <coughs> um, they make relatively modest salaries. And there's some very committed people who have spent decades. Um, committed to FDA enforcement. We've named a new Deputy Chief Counsel for Enforcement this week, Rick Bumberg, who's behind me. We spent 20 years on enforcement lit litigation with the FDA, so some very dedicated people. But I'm concerned about the revolving door aspect. Um, we've had to hire a lot of attorneys first to replace the ones that have gone, and two, to increase resources for the FDA division. How many do you have with more than three years of experience? Uh, I'd, Is I'd it half? I, I, I would guess it's, it's closer to, to two-thirds at this point. I, I'd be happy to provide that for the, for the record. To what, ex to what extent is, is rapid departure after some valuable experience in your office contribute to, to the kinds of delays in the review process? I, 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 I don't think it's been a significant factor. I mean, occasionally, where, where we have a problem um, occasionally is if there's a particular area where we, we're, we're very thinly staffed. We have, I think, a very small Office of General Counsel, considering the size uh, of, the, of the agency's responsibilities, um, sometimes there is a, a, um, the departures are concentrated in a certain area, and sometimes that is disruptive uh, for occasionally for rulemaking 
or but you lost uh, several litigation. in the medical device area did you yes not? exactly and that was one of the one of the things i'm thinking of. but in in terms of our recruiting i think it's important to notice that the revolving door is, is really swinging one way that there are really two classes of, of lawyers who've been coming in uh we've been bringing in uh, uh more experienced attorneys um with criminal prosecutorial experience experience similar to the experience that you indicated that you have uh and the very best people that we can get immediately uh, out of law school. Generally, we're looking for people that have got some scientific expertise that they can combine with their uh, legal expertise. We are not, at, at least as a general matter, recruiting in such a fashion that the many very talented third and fourth and fifth year associates from the FDA uh, law firms are coming in for a few years in the department and then going back well, out. Mr. Estrella, I guess that, that's the fundamental, you know, governing by anecdote is never although raised to an art form by Mr. Reagan is not an appropriate way ever to do business. That's, I guess, the object lesson here, that, that there have been delays in the rulemaking process. There have been circumstances uh, in, uh, in at least three investigations that the committee uh, has, uh, has examined uh, uh, for public consumption purposes because they are open. Uh, a company A uh, after district recommendations, uh, the investigative recommendations sat in your office for uh, for more than eight months. Uh, Company B, the recommendation sat in in your office for for almost uh, nine months. Uh, Company C, uh, investigation uh, after complete uh, compilation of it, uh, a company that has to remain uh, uh, nameless uh, because of the ongoing nature of it. Uh, also sits uh, uh, waiting, waiting action from the office of the general counsel. And if it's a staffing problem, uh, there, we need to know that. If, if, if investigations are not getting prosecuted because, and are sitting on desks, not because of any desire, please let the record reflect that with, 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 with clarity, but because you can't process them, then it's not a system that, that works, whether it's rulemaking or criminal investigations. I, I have a, a couple of responses to that. And uh, I will resume my seat while you answer. Yes. Uh, um, I'm certainly not going to defend slow rulemaking. I was in federal court yesterday uh, where a judge was asking me how long it, why it took so long to get a rule out. And, and quite frankly, it's one of the frustrations of my life. I've been working you know, for the agency uh, with one short break since 1985. And you know, I'd like to see the rulemaking go more quickly, but it is difficult. And I think the, 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 the line of logic that says the rulemaking is slow, the lawyers are heavily involved in the rulemaking, therefore the lawyers are responsible for the slow rulemaking, actually does not follow. Part, and, and, and same with, with in, uh, some enforcement actions. What, what, um, what is often the case is that this is tremendously legally difficult work. Um, and often we're trying to um, jerry-rig a result for the client to serve the client's interests that is not something that's easy to achieve under the existing statutory uh, authorities. Um, and that's true both in the rulemaking and that uh, can be true in the enforcement actions as well. Um, one of the, the case studies that you've, you've cited to that we've discussed with committee staff before, uh, w one of the, uh, the issues there is is essentially what the agency was seeking to achieve amounted to a recall. And as the, the chairman, I believe, indicated uh, earlier, we don't have general recall authority. So we try to do the best we can with what we have. And it takes a lot of legal work, a lot of legal creativity. And I think these people do a terrific job. I think they're, they're some of the best and the brightest and the most committed um, in the federal government. And I, and I don't think that, as a general matter, uh, that I'm in a position where I should have to make apologies for Mr. what Astrid, doing. I didn't. I didn't ask you to apologize for that. And <laughs> would the gentleman yield? Uh, uh, the gentleman of Ohio yield. For I just want. I just want the record to reflect. Uh, uh, this is not an indictment I, of the quality of the work, nor is it a reflection upon the talent of the men and women that are there. There clearly is a volume of work that is that is 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 difficult. And maybe it is, it is, it is, it's onerous and it's, and it's burdens. But there are very sharp and astute people out there who know and understand that. And if they know that there is more for you to handle than you can handle, then they understand that the system works to their advantage. Yeah, I understand, Carl. That makes it tougher for the people Mr. Kessler wants to hire. And, and it, it, un understand that, that effective enforcement has to be timely enforcement. 
I understand. And if that doesn't work, then it won't. I will yield to my, my colleague, the chairman. From if if I could respond just, just sure. for a moment. Um, I did not want to indicate that, I, that at the point where I became general counsel uh, in June of 89, that I did not conclude that uh, resources were not a problem. And, and two things have happened. One is, although the Congress has in real dollars cut the Office of General Counsel budget overall, we've managed through a variety of techniques to keep the, the number of lawyers in the office overall fairly stable. Despite the fact that the number of lawyers overall, approximately 450 throughout the entire department, is stable, there have been three areas where we have devoted additional resources. And in large part, it's to respond to the types of concerns that you're indicating here. We put additional resources into the FDA division, additional uh, resources into the healthcare financing division, where again, there have been complaints about the slowness of the rulemaking, and in ethics, where we, we want not only to discharge the, the large number of statutory responsibilities we have as well as we can, but try to be um, as proactive as we can in the ethics area so that we don't have a repeat of a number of the problems that we had in the previous decade. And, I, and I'm proud of that. Um, and I think we've done a good job. In addition to that, in the FDA area, Commissioner Kessler has been um, extremely supportive. FDA has historically provided um, a relatively small um, subsidy um, to the Office of the General Counsel. Commissioner Kessler has increased that, and specifically with the understanding that those are going to be going for experienced um, attorneys with the, the type of uh, uh, criminal law background um, that uh, the agency with its, its, its uh, recently uh, developed set of priorities needs. And we are doing our best to be responsive to the client, to serve the client, to get the client to where the client wants to go. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back my time. I do note that there's also a vote pending. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, I thank the gentleman. And uh, to follow up, um, Mr. Astru, it, it seems to me that what I'm hearing you say would lend support to the recommendation of the Edwards Commission that the FDA should be given the authority to issue its own regulations without re-review by the Department of Health and uh, Human Services Office of General Counsel. But, um, Congressman, the agency to a large extent already has that authority. As I've indicated, um, that has already um, been delegated by the Secretary to the agency. Only a relatively small number, and I, I may let Ms. Porter uh, provide you the specific standard with specificity, only a relatively small number of FDA regulations go through the department proper now, and they're the ones that have the, tend to have the broader um, societal impact, things like the food um, labeling regulations, where quite naturally the rest of the public health service, the people who work in the, uh, the welfare uh, area and other parts of the department have legitimate policy concerns that uh, should be heard as part of the rulemaking process. I don't know, uh, Ms. Porter may want to speak to that in more detail. If you will provide that for the record. Uh, we certainly can. Let me just note uh, right. uh, that I think the recommendation of the Edwards Committee was not that regulations receive no general counsel review, but that they receive no department review. And that, that I think implicit in that is that they would still be reviewed by the, the lawyers in the Food and Drug Division. But in any case, a relatively small percentage of the regulations go to the department, I think between 1 and 2 percent. But we can provide that for the record. Is it true if the agency had more statutory authority, it would make their job easier? Mr. Chairman, if I could, may I try to answer you, that? Yes, Dr. Kessler. It, it, it's very easy. I can come here and I can point the finger and say the problem is, uh, you know, general counsel and department or the department or OMB. But if you look at um, the history of regulations and getting at regulations, we at the agency have as much a burden to share on that internally. We can't point the finger. Um, the, this secretary has been extremely supportive. In, there has not been anything that I wanted to get out that he has not paid quick attention to. We have to restructure we, our management processes are in, internally within the agency, within our fault for four walls. That's where we have to direct our attention. Now there is, you know, we, 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 one good piece of news, in our restructuring we've set up a deputy commissioner for policy. That person is behind me. Um, that person has joined the agency literally a number of weeks ago, uh, Michael Taylor. 
the, the, with, the, with the mandate of, of making sure that we get out regulations, that, that we are asked to under statutes in a timely manner. So it's a management problem and we have to address it within the agency. I want to thank you very much. Uh, if there, there's no additional questions now, we're going to adjourn for just a little bit to uh, vote. We thank all of you uh, very much for being here this morning and we will return. Uh, we'll be back in about 15 minutes and call the second panel. Thank you. Yes. The subcommittee will come to order. We now have the second panel. Uh, Dr. Kessler is also on this second panel, accompanied by a number of people uh, here. And as I understand it, Dr. Peck wishes to make an opening statement. Uh, is there anyone else there who wishes to make an opening statement? Uh, Dr. Kessler, you are still under oath. Thank you. Um, I would ask those who are going to testify uh, to realize that they will also have to be under oath under the Rules Committee, and you have a copy of the Rules of the Committee and the Subcommittee before you. Is there anyone that objects to testifying under oath or that wishes to have counsel? No one objects to testifying under oath or? Well, then if you will arise and raise your right hand. You follow this way the testimony you're about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you God. Consider yourself under oath. Dr. Peck? recognized for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It has been a little over two years since I stepped in and, uh, and took command at the center level of the generic drug crisis. I'd like to provide my view of our center's management of the generic drug crisis with emphasis on the role that I and my deputy, Mr. Jerry Meyer, have played. Mr. Meyer asked me to convey to you his deep appreciation for your excusing him from this hearing so that he could be at the bedside of a gravely ill family member. Thank you. Referring to the first chart on the left, to get an accurate time perspective, consider that using the time frame that goes from 1984 to 1991 horizontally from left to right, I came to work at FDA in late 1987 and was joined by Mr. Meyer as my deputy. The generic program was one of numerous human drug programs underway at the Center for Drugs. It was and has, had been managed for some years by Dr. Marvin Seif, who reported to Dr. Peter Reinstein. Commissioner Young explained to me on my arrival that my first priorities were to enhance our AIDS drug program and to initiate fundamental changes in our new drug review system. Regarding generic drugs, I was aware of the program, but in fact was informed by many that the program was working well and needed, needed little attention. Unbeknownst to me, illegal activities had been committed by several FDA staff and generic company officials in the years and months preceding my arrival at FDA, and those are indicated in the red marks on the time chart. We vigorously committed our first nine months of duty at FDA to establishing a new division of antiviral drug products to handle AIDS drugs in an expedited manner and to laying the groundwork for substantial change in our new drug review program. In July 1988, we became startlingly aware of problems in the generic drug section when sealed investigations stimulated by this committee were announced. However, apart from from reassigning several employees, we were instructed not to interfere with these investigations. On May 11, 1989, in open public hearings, this committee revealed for the first time to me and, and, and the world the gravity of this situation. Mr. Meyer and I acted immediately to remove the generic division and office management. We were then and we remain today grateful to the superb investigative efforts of the committee staff, especially Mr. Uh, David Nelson and Reed Stuntz, for uncovering the illegal acts and irregularities uh, since our own controls had failed. Commissioner Young and I agreed that I would personally assume the sign-off authority for generic drug approvals, and we were given the green light 
to assess the situation. For the next five months, indicated in the yellow part there, Mr. Meyer and I personally oversaw the generic drugs operation, and in addition to personnel to, to personal review of pending applications, we instituted multiple managerial improvements and embarked on a long-term plan of reform, recruitment, and program rejuvenation. By September 1989, five months after assuming personal involvement in the program, Commissioner Young and I concluded that we understood the program sufficiently and had instituted sufficient change to entrust the management of the program to Dr. Bruce Burlington, one of our most capable senior managers. This enabled me to return to my center duties and to focus on other aspects of the management of this crisis, such as recruitment of a permanent head of the generics program and establishment of a scientific advisory committee. Of course, we have managed many other crises in the meantime, including loss of the director of our AIDS program, which necessitated my personally assuming the acting directorship for this entire year to shepherd the Foscarnet and DDI drug applications for AIDS. Parenthetically, I'm happy to announce today that Dr. David Feigl of the University of California at San Diego has agreed to assume the directorship of, of this division. We were successful in our recruitment efforts and in late 1990 we brought Dr. Roger Williams, an internationally respected clinical pharmacologist with extensive experience in drug development, to be the permanent head of the newly created Office of Generic Drugs. If I can have the next chart. In judging our two-year management of this crisis, it is important to view it in the context of the multiple other activities of this center and of our managerial program. Here you see the organizational chart of our center, color-coded as to change that has been made since Mr. Meyer and I assumed our posts. We have engaged in a massive program of change at the center, both organizationally and functionally, all leading towards greater efficiency in our multiple functions and services, along with a fundamental attitudinal change towards facilitating drug development. Time does not allow for a presentation on our program of change, but you can plainly see that we are managing radical change uh, in our center in drug regulation. Next chart. Specifically to our management of this crisis, before you and on the, on, the, on the next two charts is a partial list of the literally hundreds of program and personnel changes that Mr. Meyer and I have conceived of and or overseen since we took command of the crisis a little over two years ago. We won't have time to go over all of those, but specifically, I'd like to cite overseeing the product quality reaffirmation program, personally reviewing ANDAs for a five-month period, recruiting our senior clinical pharmacologist, Roger Williams, and elevation of the program to the office le level as matters that we had uh, significant personal involvement. Next, next charts. I believe the net impact of all of these and other efforts of our center and the agency is a success story in the making. First of all, we now have new scientific data as a basis for assurance that all currently marketed generic products are safe and effective. This is an extremely important attainment, in my view, as a physician and as a consumer. Believe me, in May 1989, a little over two years ago, we did not know this and we lost a lot of sleep over this crucial aspect. Secondly, I'm confident that all newly approved ANDAs since, since May of 1989 are safe and effective and bioequivalent to their brand name counterparts. Again, in May 1989, we had completely lost confidence in the data submitted to us by generic sponsors, and we had to rebuild and regain confidence in our generic drug review program. Thirdly, after the inevitable slowdown in the entry of newly approved generic drugs into the market, under the capable management of Dr. Roger Williams and his deputy, Mr. Sporn, there is strong evidence that we are continuing to move aggressively towards rapid availability of new generic drugs to consumers. The plot you see before you shows that after a drop uh, in late 1889 and uh, throughout 1990, we are now at a rate of uh, more than uh, doubling our approval of ANDAs per month, uh, now approximating uh, 20 per month. And the next slide shows a very significant counter trend 
in uh, the backlog, showing that uh, there was a large increase during the 89-90 framework, and that we're down now nearly to pre-crisis levels. Mr. Chairman, I am not claiming that all is perfect or fixed. We're committed to, to do even more, as the Commissioner expressed in his opening testimony. Somehow, Mr. Meyer and I have been accused of being arrogant, retaliatory, or unenthusiastic about generic drugs. Nothing could be further from the truth. However, to the extent that this is even perceived, we regret whatever events may have triggered that misperception. Both of us care a great deal about the generic program. Each of us have multiple family members that we encourage to take generic drugs when their physicians prescribe them. In my case, my 82-year-old father enjoys the benefits of several generic drugs, a much appreciated privilege since he is on a fixed retirement income. When I visit him at the Sunset Home Retirement Home in Concordia, Kansas, in my hometown, I often get involved in advising his cronies, who are familiar faces to me from my childhood, about their generic drug programs as well. Mr. Meyer and I are completely committed to fulfilling the intent of Congress to get safe and effective generic drugs on the market to patients as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is anyone else at the table who wishes to make a statement? Any? No. Mr. Chesmore, are you aware of the agency's special alert list? Yes, sir. One <laughs> <laughs> of the best answers I've had all day. <laughs> well, it's our understanding that this list contains 12 firms manufacturing products in 20 different locations. It also lists the date when each of the firms was added to this special alert list. Am I correct that this special alert list is a comprehensive list of firms which as of July the 1st, 1991, the FDA had determined should not receive approvals based on the agency's lack of faith in the firm because of their submission of false and fraudulent generic drug approval data. Mr. Chairman, the alert list that I am familiar with is an alert list that is generated through inspections field. We encounter situations where we're not sure, we're, where we believe that good manufacturing practices are not taking place, we will alert the appropriate center. Uh, I am not aware how many firms might be on that list at this time. I'm not sure that it's the same list which question. Well, this special alert list. Um... I might add, excuse me, sir, I'm, I might add that, that this alert list that I'm talking about is simply one that. While a firm is on this list, there should be no drug approval made at the time. Well, this special alert list is a subset, as I understand, of a larger alert list that includes firms and, in many cases, specific plants or specific processes uh, which may not be used uh, in application to obtain approval because of the agency's uncertainty regarding the compliance with good manufacturing uh, processes. Uh, that's correct. Yes. Okay. The subcommittee is aware of at least two other firms on the larger alert list that are not contained in this chart that uh, have been referred for criminal prosecution uh, through the Section 305 process. Uh, one of the firms is a contract laboratory, which presumably does not itself submit ANDAs, and another was referred for criminal violations relating to labeling problems. Is that why they are not on this special alert list? I, I really don't, don't know specifically. Perhaps someone else on the panel could uh, does know the specifics of that particular question. I don't know if Mr. Vogel. Mr. Vogel here. Well, I'm here. Could, you repeat, could you repeat the question one more time? And uh, while well, I, I have a chance to get sure. this. Sure. Thank you. Uh, the subcommittee is aware of at least two other firms on the larger alert list that are not contained in this chart that have been referred for criminal prosecution through the Section 305 process. One of the firms is a contract laboratory, which presumably does not itself permit 
uh, submit uh, ANDAs, and another was referred for criminal violations relating to labeling problems. Is that why they are not on this special alert list? The, uh, the subset of, um, of firms that you refer to on the alert list um, is a subset specifically because of findings by our field offices and the agency as a whole of, uh, uh, of events that, uh, that we feel compromise the approval process. The two firms I believe you're referring to that are not within this subset um, uh, are because, uh, uh, to my knowledge, the criteria for establishing the subset uh, have, uh, have not been, uh, uh, don't apply because we haven't found evidence as such. Well, there are at least uh, six other firms that the subcommittee has reason to believe are under criminal investigation or at least serious suspicion uh, by the FDA, the Office of Inspector General or the Federal Grand Jury in Baltimore. May we assume that they are not on this list because the agency has not yet sufficiently determined that the offenses involved are likely to have corrupted the approval process? With respect to, uh, uh, I, I think that's an accurate assumption, not knowing which specific firms you're talking to, but with, uh, you, I think it's safe to assume that, uh, that uh, if they are on the alert list and they're not within this, this subset, it's because we have not found evidence uh, that, that we believe uh, has directly corrupted the approval process. Dr. Peck, uh, are you aware of the agency's special alert list? Yes, sir, I am. It's my understanding that some of the firms on this special alert list, uh, which is a non-GMP-related uh, uh, list, uh, have been on there for over two years. They're on the list because the agency has serious reason to believe that false or fraudulent statements have been submitted to it regarding a number of their generic drug applications. You know if that's correct or not? I believe everything you've said is correct. Uh, I would add that I believe that uh, firms can enter the alert list for GMP problems as well, un unassociated with uh, concerns about fraud. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I guess, the I guess the question is, are they part of this special subset? They are. Yes. Okay. You pointed out in response to a written question posed to you for inclusion in our June the 5th hearing record that 48 percent of the effort of the Office of Generic Drugs had been devoted to reviewing applications which are on the larger alert list. First part of this question is, can you break down for us the proportion of time overall spent on working on applications from firms on this special alert list? Mr. Chairman, uh, perhaps Dr. Williams would be best to answer that question. Dr. Williams. Uh, yes, sir. Our estimate is for pending applications, about 20 percent are on those very, that small subset of firms. I'm sorry, 10 percent. And for pending supplements, it's about 20 percent. So 10 percent and 20 percent. I point out to you that the firms on this special alert list in May of 1989, uh, when this scandal became public, produced a significant proportion of the generic drugs sold in the United States and held many, if not most, of the ANDAs that the old division of generic drugs had approved post Waxman Hatch. Further, your legal counsel informed you that you were under no legal constraint requiring you to work on the applications submitted by these firms or other firms on the alert list. Wouldn't the rate of approval have been high had you not permitted the review of the generic drug companies on the special alert list? Okay. Uh, yes, sir, I think that is true. There was some diversion of our resources uh, uh, in this effort, and uh, with finalization of the fraud policy, we expect that to cease. Dr. Peck, let me come back to you. Uh, what explanation do you have for the director of the Health Care Financing Administration and to the American people for the additional cost of generic drugs that were not approved during this period of time because scarce resources were devoted to processing applications of crooks that the Center 
uh, for drug evaluation and research knew they would not approve? I believe it would be difficult to quantify, um, but conceivably drugs that we have, uh, generic drugs that we've approved for example, in August or July could have been approved in earlier months had we had uh, full use of our resources and had not had some diverted to. Um, the one application that comes to mind is the recently approved uh, generic version of diazide, uh, which uh, perhaps falls under the so-called blockbuster uh, definition, a large volume, very useful. Uh, drug, and I think that perhaps we could come up with some some uh, estimates of the potential impact. I believe that uh, that this uh, has cost consumers money by not having this drug available, and I find that regrettable. Mr. Chair, if, if, if I may, Dr. Owens, the the fraud policy. Uh, the, the agency made a decision to go a uh, public comment uh, open process because it saw itself as change in policy. Um, that was a decision. One could argue whether that was a prudent decision, uh, but it was the, it saw the agency saw itself as changing policy and wanted to go a more formal route than just uh, doing it. Um, you can argue um, whether. In, in, the, in the whole scheme of things, we may have lost some time. But that fraud policy is now in effect. I think it will withstand any challenge now because, in fact, uh, we've gone through the public process. Um, and if we had gone through and just put it in effect and basically changed our policies, as I understand them, and not reviewed applications, I think we could also have been expected, to, it could have taken time on the other end. Um, I think it was prudent, um, perhaps uh, Ms. Porter or David Adams, uh, uh, who were involved, would, would care to comment. I think that what Dr. Kleschler has stated is, that is, is correct. The agency had a policy choice uh, uh, and chose the more prudent course, which was to allow the opportunity for public comment before putting the fraud policy in effect. We're not suggesting it was legally required to do so. But I think given that opportunity has allowed for a full raising of the issues and will make the policy more defensible. It seems to me that I recall from previous hearings that, uh, that we've had that uh, there was a considerable amount of resources spent on investigation um, of those uh, firms who had no chance of uh, having their generic drugs approved because of being uh, suspect. Mr. Chairman, if, if it were up to me and if uh, I weren't acting, I mean, as a government official, I mean, I have no use for uh, reviewing any of these. I mean, the, if you're caught in the act, if there's reason, I mean, you know, I don't want to see you. I mean, and, and I, I mean, if left to my own devices, I, you know, you could I'll just throw them out. Um, but we don't operate in that fashion. Um, we, we have to be prudent. Um, and, and I think that the agency uh, had a choice to make. You can argue either side. Um, and I think that the, the bottom line is um, we can spend a lot of time on the past. The fraud policy, though, is in effect. Um, and we're not going to waste time now. We, as I understand it, and Dr. Williams can comment, I think by instituting that policy, we probably um, throw out what, about 10 percent? 10 percent of pending and 20 percent. Which, yes. which, which, which really is, um, again, we've started implementing it. it. It's not that even though the policy is published, what, this week, uh, yesterday, uh, we, it wasn't that we started yesterday. Uh, it, it's a trade-off. There's no perfect uh, point in time when this should have been put in place, in my opinion. I understand that. Uh, but I guess to be sure that I understand where we are right now, that that policy is no longer being followed. The, the, the policy of spending the time on these firms that's have correct. no chance of getting... That's correct, Mr. Chairman. So that policy is no longer being followed? We're, absolutely. Okay. Um, right. 
Let me come back to you, Dr. Peck. Uh, in both your written response to our questions for the June the 5th hearing and in the agency's preamble to the fraud policy, the Senate has refused to provide specific guidance for when it will waive the general policy of deferring review on a drug that is not itself subject to fraud claims, but on other drugs that may be subject to fraud claims produced by the same company. Isn't it true that the Senate gives drugs priority classifications? Um, in, in the new drug review area, there is an internal mechanism for identifying uh, priority of review. Uh, it could be called the ABC system, uh, and it's meant to prior prioritize uh, the expected uh, benefit relative to other drugs on the market. But we do not have a similar policy in place within the generic program. Why is it so difficult for the Senate since it already assigns priorities to different kinds of drugs to distinguish for the public which drugs are so important that you would never consider the deferral of review absent the specific fraud claim for that drug versus those which the Senate considers a much lower priority, for example, generic veterinary drugs or generic human drugs? Um, if, if I understood your question, you're, you're wondering why we have one policy in new drug, another policy in generic drugs, and uh, perhaps an even third policy or, or an inconsistent policy yeah, in veterinary, veterinary drugs, drugs. versus uh, genetic, uh, veterinary drugs versus genetic human drugs, yes. Um, I guess I'm really not in a position to compare and contrast the veterinary and the human uh, since my responsibility is exclusively in the uh, Center for Drugs. Let me go to Dr. Kessler, if I may, and I assume from the wording of the fraud policy and the preamble that the individual centers will be making the determination of which firm should suffer the substantive deferral of review. Is that correct? I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I just didn't yep. hear part well, of the question. I assume question. from the wording of the fraud policy and the preamble that the individual centers That's will be making the determination of which firm should suffer substantive deferral of review. The, the fraud policy is set out in such a way um, that it gives general guidelines, but its implementation, there needs to be separate implementation by each of the centers. Dr. Peck, now that the fraud policy has been published, is it safe to assume that the firms on the special alert list will have their substantive reviews deferred and that the continued waste of review of resources in the Office of Generic Drugs will cease, at least for the time being? I guess that's what we've already covered. Uh, yes, sir, I can assure that. Uh, review has ceased now. We're preparing a letters that will go out to the affected firms informing them of this fact and also that they have to go through the certifying process as defined in the fraud policy. Uh, the office is also working on a procedure and policy guide that it's in its final stages to define how they can be uh, resurrected in terms of getting back to the queue. I want to ask uh, Dr. Peck and uh, Mr. Chesmore this. With regard to the question of the use of outside auditors or outside consultants to audit the firm's ANDAs after the agency has determined that there may be a practice or pattern of false statements, isn't it true that in the case of American Therapeutics Incorporated, the outside consultants reported no fraud in applications that the agency subsequently determined did contain either fraud or false statements? I think uh, Mr. Vogel probably. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Vogel. I believe the situation you're referring to um, concerns a matter where the outside report, uh, and, and, and this is information that we received from, 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 the, uh, from ATI as, as well as its counsel, that the outside uh, consultant that did the internal audits for American Therapeutics, Inc. reported not finding significant discrepancies However, when FDA um, did its audit, uh, that audit disclosed uh, some discrepancies. Uh, our understanding from the firm of the reason why their own internal auditor didn't find it was because that auditor did not have access to certain records, and FDA ultimately got access to those records. Isn't it true that the agency has serious questions regarding the work of outside consultants in PAR? Chelsea and perhaps others that have been undertaken by so-called independent auditors? Without, uh, I'm really not prepared to talk about the reviews done for any particular firm at this point, but I can state that, that whenever, that first of all, 
FDA will not rely solely on what those outside auditors do for these firms. Uh, FDA will review what those outside auditors do for those firms uh, in terms of what process they followed, specifically what, how free were they to follow that process, and, ulti and ultimately what the results were. That will supplement FDA's own efforts to evaluate the, uh, the submissions that the firms um, uh, have submitted to the agency. Uh, it's only to supplement FDA's efforts. Now, one of the concerns, um, uh, and it's a, it's a legitimate concern, has to do with if, in fact, there are fraudulent records, uh, how do you know when you look at a record that it's true on its face? Uh, that's, a, that's a question the agency has. It's a question that, that's gonna be, that has been and will continue to be put to these, these firms. Um, and, and quite frankly, the answers are difficult. Uh, but we're, we're, we're looking at, at all angles there, all aspects of that internal audit to be sure that we can confidently rely on our results. In the case of firms such as those on this special alert list where there have been evidence of pervasive fraud that extends in certain of these cases well beyond one plant or one employee, is it the agency's intention to audit each of the audits of the outside consultants before it is satisfied that a given application is free of fraud? In my view, absolutely, we will look at each and every audit conducted by this outside independent auditor, assuming we have confidence in what those auditors are going to provide. We're not going to look at them if we don't have confidence in them. If we do have a level of confidence, we're going to look at them absolutely. Uh, in my view, until we look at each and every one and do our own thorough investigation, we will not know the full nature and scope of, of any problems that did occur. And therefore, uh, uh, that must occur before we're comfortable that our validity assessment on pending applications has been comprehensive enough. Thank you. Mr. Upton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Kessler, welcome. Uh, as you know, we have had hearings uh, earlier this year with regard to the slow pace of generic drug applications. And I know it was very heartening for me to hear in your testimony that we've made remarkable progress over from where we were last year uh, this year, I think you cited we had, the FDA uh, has approved, I think it was 108 uh, generic drugs uh, versus last year, uh, only 80. So we're way ahead of, of last year's pace, which I think is very encouraging, certainly to all of us here on the panel. But when do you expect the FDA to actually complete work on the policy and the procedures uh, that you mentioned regarding the expedition, or to expedite the review of the economically and uh, therapeutically significant generic drugs. And in your response, if do you think that, uh, would you encourage us to, uh, to make some legislative changes to, to help you make your way? Congressman, you're referring to the blockbuster That's right. issue. Uh, let me tell you how I see that. I think the most important thing is to get the generic drug process up to speed so that in the normal course of events, it can handle blockbusters. Firms know when a drug is coming off patent, they leave enough time, uh, they, they apply before that time, and through the normal course of events, that the drug gets approved at the time uh, uh, the pioneer goes off patent. That's what I would like to see happen. That's what I would like the standard operating procedure to be. I think it's best if we get the system up so it can handle it that way. I recognize, though, the affirmative obligation that Congress set out in the 84 Act to make sure that, we, that there not be gaps, um, that we get important generics to the market. What I am proposing, and what I proposed this morning, is not that we change, the, 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 we still tr strive to get the process to handle blockbusters. But if there is evidence that there's going to be a gap, if there is going uh, to be where the American public uh, would have an opportunity to have a generic, and it is the agency that would be holding up the process, that the commissioner have the discretion, which I believe under the current rules and regulation the commissioner now has, and in fact, I have in fact invoked that once in a safety in, uh, instance, and I'll, I'll make mention of that. I believe that the commissioner should have the discretion to expedite review 
of an important generic drug so the American people can have that available. Now, I've asked the center, uh, and specifically Dr. Williams in the Office of Generic Drugs, to devise criteria, which he has agreed to do certainly by the end of this year, so that there be criteria that governs the commissioner's discretion. I have once uh, the, the cue that we is now post-generic drug scandal is, is, is treated very religiously. Uh, I've only once asked that that cue be altered, and I did it for safety reasons. Uh, subsequently, soon after I arrived at the agency, we had the Sudafed tampering inc uh, incident. And I felt that it was important if a manufacturer was, gonna, was willing to switch from a capsule to a, uh, uh, another form that was more tamper resistant, that that was in the public's interest, and I agreed to expedite any applications um, so that we would have safer drugs on the market. That's the only time I've done it. I think there may be a rare instance where we're seeing a gap. Uh, a gap's going to occur, uh, and the commissioner should exercise discretion. I would hope by the end of the year that we would have their criteria to govern uh, that, uh, those kinds of actions. You mentioned a, a little bit in your testimony uh, earlier on about the monograph option. Uh, do you need uh, is this something that you're going to be seeking public comments on? Is this something that you're going to put regulations out on? Is this something that I, you'd like our committee to help prompt you or uh, have, a, have a good dialogue? Uh, oh, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think we need a very strong dialogue. I, I would hope, I see, I mean, th there's some signs, as Dr. Peck has art, uh, articulated, the fact that we had 21 approvals uh, this last month. I see productivity uh, on the rise. Um, I'm not sure we're there yet. I know we're not there yet. I see an increasing number of drugs coming off patent. Um, I see, I mean, we're not going to need an office of generic drugs. I mean, we almost need a, I mean, just looking at what's coming off patent and the number of applications that anticipate it, we're going to have an incredible workload. And I, I just, if we're not able to keep up, and I'd like the changes that we put in place, that we're talking about putting in place, the shift to the field of certain uh, additional responsibilities. I'd like that system to work. But I, I'm keeping a careful eye on it. I think the jury's still out. And all I'm saying this morning is that if, in fact, we can't get the kind of productivity with the assurances of safety that we want, we may need to look at other alternative approaches. And the monograph, it's a very complicated system. It's not a new idea. It's been thought about uh, a lot. But we're, we're, we're bringing it a little further uh, higher up in, as far as our, our, our level of discussion. Uh, Docs, Dr. Williams has a group um, that, that's looking at it. I think it is worthy of discussion and debate. It's not without problems. But if we can't fix the system with the current tools, I think we owe the public and the Congress, the obligation to think about new alternatives in the monograph may be one. Are you actually thinking about doing public comments? Or, we, or we, we, we would or? certainly. Um, we have uh, a study underway uh, that Dr. Williams has started. Um, we, we, a task force is being put together. Uh, and in fact, there has been a request for comments just in general terms about monographs, and I believe that closed sometime in the late August, and they will be reviewed too. But, they, but, but this is not something that we're putting into place uh, today or, or this week or this month. This is going to be, this is going to involve a lot of public comment, and, and if we need it, it's going to require a lot of congressional input too. The last question that I, that I have involves uh, bottled water. Uh, I know you've heard a lot about bottled water. Uh, particularly since uh, the deadline really for the regs, I think it was 180 days once the act passed, which uh, passed before I was actually on the committee. And I know that you're getting close. Uh, it's my understanding that you've completed drafting proposals, at least internally, uh, with regard to bottled water regulations. Uh, they've yet to be published, from what I understand. What, can you give us an idea or a timetable of what, what you're expecting? The, the, there are, um, just let's make sure we're talking about the same bottled water. There is something that we refer to as the 34 contaminants poli uh, policy. Um, and, and that's the one that's been under discussion. And I have asked our own FDA people for a timetable. And I got a timetable. But 
Congressman, I'm a, you know, and they told me we would have it out by the agency, out of the agency, by October 31st. But I, out of the agency, not necessarily published. But, but I'm concerned. And you have to know. I just I, bought two bottles this uh, last week. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's not for a lack of attention. I, the people who are writing the regs in the Center for Foods, um, and if it sounds like making excuses, so be it, but you have to know what, where I stand on this. They're working day and night on also getting out on nutritional labeling, to, uh, the requirements, the November 8th deadline that, that um, the Congress has set to get out just an enormous amount of Nutrition Labeling and Education Act uh, regulations. It is the ma most major effort uh, of regulation writing that I've ever seen. A and you have people working day and night trying to meet those deadlines uh, so that that statute can be implemented. Um, I'm just not sure. We're, we're committed to, to, to working expeditiously. Just understand, uh, w you know, the, the task ahead of us will move ahead as quickly as we can. Okay, hey, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Wyden. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rowland. Dr. Kessler, uh, welcome. And my apologies for coming for the afternoon session rather than, uh, than the morning. As you know, this uh, subcommittee's had a longstanding interest in issues relating to medical devices and has been particularly interested in this matter uh, of collagen and some of the uh, issues that have been, uh, been debated relating uh, to that uh, particular product. To start uh, the discussion uh, in this area, just so we can get your latest assessment uh, with respect to uh, this product, in the agency's view, is there a statistically significant connection between the use of collagen and the onset of these very serious uh, autoimmune diseases. What is the agency's position on that issue? Mr. Wyden, um, I think probably Mr. Benson's in the best position to answer that question, and I'd be happy to comment after uh, he tries to answer that question. The, uh I should ask to start with at what confidence level you're talking about, 95, 91, so on down the line. I think the, if I may give a little background, but, Mr. Wyden. But, 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 Dr. Benson, this is a term of art. In January of 1990, my understanding, prior to Dr. Kessler uh, becoming the uh, head of the agency, it was the determination of the agency that there was no statistically significant association or connection between the onset of these serious medical problems and the use of collagen. It has now been rumored and discussed in various kinds of forums that the agency may have changed its position on that issue. So using the barometer you used in 1990 when you made the judgment that there wasn't a statistically uh, significant association, does the agency find now that there is? The, the answer to your question is at, the, at, at less than the 95 percent confidence level, we do see uh, a, a, a statistical significant association. But I would like to, I'd like to give you a little bit of background there to put that into context, if I may. Uh, we're work, we continue to work hard to uh, zero in on the actual cases of, of PMDM that, that have been reported. Uh, there, those cases are, are hard to identify in, in many, in, 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 depending on the, the uh, cloudiness of the issue, whether there's cancer, other disease conditions, and so on. We're talking about on the order of 10 or 15 cases out of a, a population of something on the order of 350 to 400,000. So it's a very difficult scientific statistical call to make. But, but let's be clear on this point. The agency is changing its position because in January of 1990, as I understand it, using the very same test, the agency said there was no statistically significant connection between I, collagen and these diseases. I, now, not, using the same test, it's the determination of the agency that there is a statistically significant connection. Is that correct? The, 
uh, I'm not sure of the dates, but, but we had concluded that at the 95% level that there was okay. not significant significance. All right. At the, may, may I just Please. flesh it out a little bit? The, the, the way that, that we progress on this, though, is we know what the expected incidence in a given population of PMDM would be. In order then to reach a, 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 a level of, of significance, you have to then identify cases that have been reported. So we continue to look at those cases. We continue to look for new cases, you know, so we make sure we get the right answer. But yes, there has been that change. Okay. I could, you, could you tell me what the agency bases its change on? I mean, you have, in answer to the initial question I've asked, talked essentially about how there's a relatively small number of cases in, in your uh, judgment. Yet, it's quite clear to me that the agency has now made a formal change in its position. Could you give us the justification this afternoon for that change uh, in the agency's position? As I already said, we continue to look at cases. We continue to make sure that the, that the diagnosis that was given in the medical records are, in fact, appropriate for a determination of this particular disease, that is, PMDM. Um, the, the change that you reference uh, came about as a result of identifying one more case that would, that would add into those already identified. That's a simple answer to your question. Now, I would assume that this change in the agency's position is based on the uh, autoimmune cases reported uh, primarily through the medical device uh, you know, reporting system. It's been estimated that fewer than 10 percent of the adverse uh, reactions that are experienced or reported uh, through these uh, systems. What additional steps is FDA taking so that we could get a better uh, handle uh, on uh, the actual number of uh, cases uh, where uh, collagen is related to these uh, connective uh, tissue diseases. The, we, we, we attempt to look at any database that's available to us on this, whether that's from the company. We got uh, reports from the Texas State Health Department. Uh, our own uh, reporting re uh, database that you mentioned, the uh, MDR. Uh, we will be uh, initiating a user reporting system as a result of the new device amendments. Uh, all those databases will be available to us. It's also the responsibility of the company to report. Uh, um, you know, hopefully they're also looking. Um, I, I, I think that it, it may be appropriate to go beyond that and, and you know, do, do a spe some special contracting for something like this. Now, the subcommittee staff in its investigation uh, found that neither the FDA nor any of the state or federal agencies had ever verified the accuracy of this uh, particular uh, corporation that makes uh, uh, this product's uh, treatment figures. Do you anticipate changing FDA procedures for verifying and validating uh, critical information submitted uh, to the agency? I would assume that uh, in this regard we might be talking about a uh, different process for FDA to uh, select the data or uh, gather it so that it wouldn't just be relying on the company. And what I would like to see is whether or not the uh, agency anticipates using a different approach uh, in the future for verifying and validating this uh, critical information. I, I think that's a good question. If I understand you correctly, you're, uh, or to put it in FDA language, you're, you're asking what, what are we planning to do to assure that the effectiveness data of the product is in fact valid. And, and I should say that in <coughs> Our, our decisions have to be based on that. We are, you know, fundamentally, we, we try to make a decision on product approval based on the effectiveness of product weighed against the risks that that product presents. And obviously, if we don't have good effective da effectiveness data, that, that, that you can't make that decision. You can't make that decision well. Um, I think the, in, the, in the case of uh, uh, one action that we are, we are taking now is, is to order the company to uh, or submit to us 
a, a uh, effectiveness data so that we will have a better handle on that. That data will be audited so that we'll be assured that it in fact is accurate. That, that's a new approach. With respect to that last point, Dr. Benson, I don't believe I've heard the agency using that technique in the past. Is that correct? That's, that's, a, that's true. This is a, an instrument of, again, the new device amendments that allows us to require post-market surveillance of one kind or another. And we are using it here. I think it's the first time that we've used this is th This is the first case, then, and, and uh, in effect, using uh, the most recent rendition of the uh, statute, you're adopting this procedure for collagen uh, as part of this finding of the. It, it really isn't the first time I misspoke. I think there have been a couple of other times. It'll be the first time that we will have used it for effectiveness data, though, okay. I think. Has uh, the agency asked uh, the CDC to communicate uh, to the medical community, particularly people like dermatologists, uh, plastic surgeons, uh, rheumatologists, uh, uh, the agency's interest in, uh, in this issue and particularly the connection between collagen and uh, uh, these autoimmune concerns? I, I don't know whether we've asked CDC to do that per se. We, we, we hopefully we're working closely with CDC. We'll be doing some of that ourselves, as a matter of fact, directly. The CDC estimated to the staff that it would cost about $500,000 to design and conduct a statistically uh, valid uh, study to further uh, examine uh, this issue. Does the agency intend to ask CDC to undertake uh, this study? We haven't made a decision on that. Uh, it, it certainly, those kinds of, of, of programs, one has to balance against resources available. That's true for us, true for CDC. I would love to be able to have good, solid data on this issue. Yeah, Do, Do, yeah I want to get your opinion on, on this, uh, uh, Dr. Kessler, because this relates to further information on the causal uh, 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 relation. Uh, uh, and it would, uh, seem, it would seem to me that this kind of study, given the fact that the agency has made a major policy shift uh, in its position from January 1990 or thereabouts to, uh, you know, summer of 1991, that you all would want to follow it up. And I'd be interested in your views on that. We, we certainly want to follow it up. Uh, you're asking questions. That we're in the midst um, of a very intense uh, look at that data and, as you say, policy change. Um, as of when, we, when I was briefed as of this morning, I was told by scientists uh, at, our, at CDRH that there was an association at the 91 percent confidence level, at least at the 91 confidence level, but not at the 95 percent. Uh, I was on the phone yesterday. Uh, trying to talk to, you have to understand, very small changes in databases. The expected incidence being 3.5 or 3.8 can shift statistical association. We have an association at least at 91 percent. Uh, it may be at 95. It, it, I, we, 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 the, the databases, I mean, are somewhat, we don't have all the answers in today as of this morning. Uh, we are moving very expeditiously. What I would like to do, and I think Mr. Benson and I are in agreement, is we would like to be able to take all the evidence that we've gathered over the last couple of weeks, which do suggest a potential policy change um, and uh, an association. We'd like to submit that uh, to the best scientific scrutiny peer review. We'd like to do that expeditiously. If we can't answer the question with the data we have, then I have no problems. Uh, I'm always uh, intrigued when one federal agency asks another federal agency to fund the study. Um, but we, we, we have to get there. Um, but my, my, the, the first thing is we need a couple of more days uh, to shore up our numbers. We need to submit this to, to peer review. And if we need additional studies, we will go after them. Mr. Chairman, I'll have some additional questions on another round. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Biden, I have some questions that I want to ask about uh, labeling, and I think we're going to uh, go to the five-minute uh, rule on questions here, uh, or else we'll be here all afternoon. But let me uh, 
ask you about uh, some labeling problems. Uh, in February of 1991, the FDA approved the removal from the labels of Zyderm and Zyplast, language indicating that the products were contraindicated for use by people who had personal histories of autoimmune disease. The contraindication was replaced by a warning, which in effect permits and encourages physicians to use the products uh, with those patients. This action follows an earlier labeling change, which removed a similar contraindication of the product for patients with direct familial histories of autoimmune disease. On April 16th and June 11th, uh, you were written expressing the subcommittee's concerns about these changes. On August 20th, you wrote saying that Dr. Temple of the Centers for Drug Evaluation and Research was studying the issue. Uh, what progress can you report on your study of this issue? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, all I know is it, it has been referred to Dr. Temple and I've not heard back. Okay. Can we get you to submit for the record uh, an answer to that question? I would be happy to, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure that you're aware that people with personal and direct familial histories of autoimmune diseases were excluded from the clinical trials with the result that we have been deprived of any scientific knowledge of how these people will react to these products. Do you have any concern about the ethics of removing the contraindication of this product for a group of people for whom it has never been demonstrated safe and effective and who already demonstrate autoimmune problems. Mr. Chairman, I'm just not uh, familiar with that particular issue. And I, again, I'd be happy to, I don't know if anyone else can. Is uh, anyone else at the table there that may be able to uh, shed some light on this question? Uh, the answer is, of course, we're concerned. I mean, the, the, and, and the, the uh, change in labeling that you refer to should not single any reduction in that concern. The, the, the point is that the, the change was done to reflect uh, the understanding that the center had of the of the agency policy on contraindications versus warnings and so on. So absolutely, we are concerned. Well, what are you, what are you doing about it then? Well, the the in, in all of the studies that we've been talking about, um, making sure that the warnings on the labeling of the product are in fact appropriate trying to do a better job of, of getting a handle on uh, any other uh, side effects, uh, all, you know, I think support our concern and support making sure that, that patients are properly warned. We're, we're also planning a major and in fact in the process of getting uh, consumer information out that will help people understand and be able to discuss with their physicians any problems that they may have or any risks that they, they may be, in fact, taking. Let me ask you, isn't it true that regulations require uh, contraindications of a product only when they have proven adverse effects? My understanding is that uh, that's right, that, that a contraindication, is that what you said? I'm, I yes, missed the contraindication. Class. contraindication. proven adverse effects. That's exactly right. That's my understanding, yes. Well, with, with collagen, <clears throat> is it correct to say that you had controlled adequate trials? Um, <coughs> that's that's a, a somewhat controversial question. At the time that those trials were run, uh, they were run actually under the, uh, uh, the state of California's jurisdiction in that the agency had no um, regulations on the books for governing uh, clinical trials. Are you contemplating reevaluating uh, those trials for pre market approval? Mr. Dingle asked us to do just that. We are in the process of, of taking a hard look at the, the uh, data that was submitted and any <laughs> other data that we have and, and the validity of the trials that were in fact run right now. One other question that I wish to ask you. Recently, FDA investigators seized about $5 million of Collagen Corporation's injectable bovine collagen products because the corporation failed to include a warning on the possible link between injectable collagen and a broad range of connective tissue diseases. The corporation admits it dropped the warning, but says that was an accident, a minor clerical error, and the FDA acted precipitously. I find it hard to believe that the FDA would have taken such strong action if it believed a clerical error was responsible for the omitted wording. 
I'd like to hear FDA's side of this story. What do you see in this issue or in the corporation's behavior regarding labeling that convinced you that the incident was not a minor clerical error and impelled you to take the seizure action? Um, shall I go ahead? The, to put that into context, the way labeling changes usually work is there's discussions either by mail or in meetings, face-to-face -face meetings with uh, sponsors on a given product. Those, those discussions lead to an agreement for what, what labeling, what warnings should be contained in labeling and so on. Um, then the, the, uh, uh, man, the uh, sponsor would then send us, you know, the, 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 uh, something in writing that confirmed that labeling. In this particular case, as I understand it, uh, uh, when that was sent in, uh, a, a change had been made. The company says it was a clerical error. Uh, it was a significant error in our view. And uh, we, we just have to be in a position of once an agreement is made that that agreement is stuck to. Mr. Chairman, perhaps uh, Mr. Johnson would like to answer that question. I think the characterization of, uh, of the action that we took and the basis of our action as being clerical is, is indeed unfortunate. Um, I think that the record clearly reflects that uh, the labeling uh, relationship or relationship between the college and corporation and the Food and Drug Administration as to labeling has, uh, has been one that has, in my words, uh, been an attempt on the part of the company, and, and, and it's not a unique attempt. Uh, t to play the organization like a fine-tuned instrument. Um, it, was, uh, it was an effort to exploit the frailties of the bureaucracy. And in some cases, there was success, sufficient success that there was continued efforts to do that. We've had an experience with collagen over the last several years, eight or nine years, dealing with labeling issues. And in our experience, we have found that collagen corporation changes uh, uh, words, phrases, adds information to labeling beyond that which was approved uh, by the Food and Drug Administration, and they do so under the guise of complying with the requirement, the approved labeling format. In a number of situations, it's been very critical information. Interestingly enough, it frequently is information that is uh, beneficial uh, to the uh, uh, promotion of the product. In this instant episode, when that came to our attention, uh, in my view, it was more of the same. And, and while the company can uh, characterize as clerical the omission of a very important aspect of a warning, uh, I think that's unfortunate. I think it interesting that in the same label, the addition of references that had a tendency to minimize other warnings uh, is an interesting clerical error to have made in the same label. Uh, there are other uh, uh, issues in the same label uh, that reflect the same kind of conduct. So I think that uh, in this particular situation we had an extensive history. We saw that same history being replayed once again <clears throat> in this situation uh, and we just decided that enough is enough. You're not going to play this instrument. We're not going to play this game. Uh, and we decided that the seizure was, was the, the way to do that. Uh, the product was violative. Uh, it needed to be removed from the market, and we needed to send a signal that we are not going to tolerate that kind of conduct. Well, I see that my time is up, but I, this incident that, that we first focus on is more of a pattern rather than an isolated incident, Then, and you've uh, seen this uh, happen uh, repeatedly. Uh, certainly, it could be very dangerous to a patient. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me go. Dr. Rowland, uh, if I could just be recognized for a couple of minutes to pick up on, I think, the important yes. point that, uh, that you've, of just, uh, you've just made. As I understood that, that last comment, what you're saying then is that this seizure was not some kind of clerical error or something like, uh, like that, as, as we've heard. But basically, the company was engaged in a blatant attempt to avoid the labeling law that they would be talking with the agency about a particular aspect of labeling, and that would be under negotiations, and they would go out and, in effect, add all this language as it relates to the label, 
that essentially violates uh, uh, the process for approval of labeling. Isn't that correct? Uh, I, I, you, you can characterize it in a number of ways. I, I certainly think it's strange that, uh, that something of this type can be, can be characterized as clerical. I think it's strange that in our experiences with them before, uh, changes have been camouflaged with assertions that uh, we have implemented the approved label. Uh, they, in addition to that, there, there have been additions uh, of, of information that tends to reinforce a position, minimize a warning. Whether that's clerical ineptness, uh, incompetence, uh, fraudulent, is left to, uh, to whoever wishes to decide that. In either regard, the product is, is inappropriate and it is conduct we should just, not permit. Just out of, out of curiosity, if these were all just clerical errors, it would probably be a split between those that favored the company and those that didn't. Over the years, did most of these so-called clerical errors seem to favor the company in its approach? Of the ones that I am aware, they all had a favorable impact. One last uh, question, if I might, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your yielding on that point because I thought the question you asked was uh, extremely uh, important. Uh, perhaps for, for you, uh, uh, Dr. Benson, and involve your associates if, uh, if you think appropriate. FDA has uh, told uh, the Collagen Corporation that its products are not uh, inject, uh, approved for injection uh, into the vermilion of, uh, of the lips. Now, the subcommittee has got some video uh, training uh, tapes which show the physician uh, injecting uh, the product into uh, the vermilion of the lip. Nothing on the tape that the subcommittee has uh, secured warns physicians that this is an unapproved uh, use. Does the FDA plan to require the corporation to withdraw this uh, particular training tape from circulation and notify uh, the physicians uh, who've received uh, the tape that such use is uh, not approved? I'm not on top of our, our specific plans, but let me make it hypothetical and say that it, it, we certainly would do something along those lines. I think that it's very important that uh, any kind of promotional activities for unapproved uses be stopped. Now, the subcommittee has uh, secured another uh, videotape uh, that Collagen has uh, got in circulation. This one uh, is directed at potential uh, patients. It tells the patients that 1 to 2 percent of uh, the Zyderm uh, users who didn't uh, react to the test uh, dose would experience a uh, reaction to treatment. The tape says that these reactions will not affect the person's health. And there seem to be some questions as to whether uh, this accurately uh, affect, affect, relates to the product's uh, MDR uh, experience. And some questions as to whether it uh, is deceptive in its uh, portrayal of the risks of, uh, of the product uh, use. Is FDA reviewing this uh, video uh, to try to determine if it's, uh, it's fair and accurate, and what I've described to you, does that sound fair and accurate to you? Um, if, if we aren't reviewing it, I can assure you, as we, we, we now will, <laughs> and no, it doesn't, it doesn't seem fair and accurate. Okay. One last uh, question, uh, if I might, uh, Mr. Chairman. The subcommittee staff has interviewed a number of patients who've had serious uh, local uh, systemic uh, uh, reactions after having collagen in injections. Many of them are women who report that they never saw the patient insert labeling that was approved by the agency. Instead of the FDA approved labeling, they were given an advertising brochure which provided minimal in information uh, on the risks of uh, these particular injections and focused uh, only on the cosmetic uh, improvements that were involved. Does FDA have plans now to review these patient uh, brochures, uh, so-called, uh, uh, for medical devices, or to require that, that, that such advertising information include essential warning material from the patient label? I think you've identified a, a, a serious concern, and it's one that we're going to deal with. And Dr. Kessler, do you want to? Absolutely, Congressman. Uh, we, first of all, we, we have to make sure that the, uh, the, the promotional materials that are being disseminated now 
are not false and misleading. And I think it goes even a, a step further. I think we have to figure out ways to get useful information to consumers uh, so that they understand the risks and benefits. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wyden. When the FDA, uh, when the FDA mm. originally approved Lyderm corrections uh, were supposed to last an average of 18 months, uh, with some lasting for three years. Clinical experience seemed to indicate that corrections last only two to four months before reinjections are required. Uh, is this reduced efficacy a cause for concern for the FDA, especially in light of the questions about product safety? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, a decision of whether a, a device can stay on the market ends up being a risk-benefit uh, decision. Uh, we've been talking about the risks, uh, about connective tissue uh, risks, and the issue is what are the uh, device's benefits. Uh, and certainly the length of time a, drug, a device is effective uh, tells you what the benefits are. If, if, it's, if it's only going to be effective for a couple of months versus for a longer period, it has less benefits. And then the issue of risks versus benefits, when you weigh them, it's a different equation. And uh, Mr. Benson can comment, but uh, my understanding is we have required, we have now required the firm to affirmatively undertake a study that uh, looks at what the effectiveness is of collagen. As I understand it, uh, the, th there is a question as far as effectiveness, Dr. Rowland, of what kind of defect you're filling. Um, and those kind of defects, uh, such as uh, pockmarks uh, that are uh, not wrinkles, and not in weight-bearing areas, they may, it makes sense to me, just as a physician, uh, that they may stay in place longer. But in those areas, I am hearing from my, some of my plastic surgery co uh, colleagues that the numbers that you're suggesting are what some of them are at least seeing. But we have to be true to the science, and we've asked for a study to be undertaken by, but it will affect the risk-benefit equation. Thank you. Well, Fibril manufactured by Mena is a product similar to Zyderm Zyplast, except that it is made of porcine collagen, pig. Uh, is FDA examining the MDRs and company complaint files for this product to determine whether problems similar to those found with Zyderm Zyplast are being experienced with Fibril? We, we are examining not only the MDR database, but, but any, any information that we can find to, 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 to see what the, the uh, side effects look like. Uh, well, Dr. Dr. Kessler, the, uh, the medical device uh, contagen is currently pending approval at FDA. This product uh, proposed to treat urinary incontinence is bovine collagen based and would require 20 to 30 cc, maybe perhaps 15 to 20 times the amount for cosmetic uh, purposes to be injected into a very vascular area of the human body. Some physicians are concerned that pulmonary emboli will result. Several contagen patients have died from pulmonary complications, one within five weeks of receiving contagen, contagen injections. Is FDA concerned about the possibility of pulmonary emboli arising from contagen therapy as well as immunogenicity of contagen? Is this is a, something that's under review on, as part of a PMA? Beg pardon? Is this something? I am not. Uh, uh, familiar with this, and I, uh, I, you know, we'd be happy to. Could you defer to someone else on the panel who may be? I, I think the, um, the the concern we have, sir, is that th this is it, uh, part of a, a pending application. And let me just say that we will, assuming that that's the case, we will carefully review those issues. So that's the action that you intend to take at this time: is is reviewing those issues before proceeding. If I may be hypothetical, yes. We, we, we would review those issues before taking action. Uh, well, of 191 patients who were originally active in the uh, clinical study, six have died. So naturally, uh, Collagen Corporation reports that none of these deaths were due to its product. Uh, if Collagen Corporation is to be to believe, no adverse reaction is ever related to its products. It seems to me that Conservatism and protection of the public health requires that one assume a connection between product and reaction until rigorous test results can rule out such an association. Is FDA concerned about the death rate in the contagen clinical trial? Of course, you've already answered that you will be looking at uh, that <coughs> further. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, I'll just ask you to submit uh, uh, to the subcommittee uh, information that you might have on that that you may not have at your fingertips right now. We'd be delighted to do that, sir. See, the chairman of the full committee has uh, has returned, and I will defer to him at this point. Uh, Dr. Kessler, it is my understanding that as a result of the lessons learned in the recent scandals associated with generic drug approvals, that various FDA centers have strengthened their pre-approval inspection programs. I believe that you and the agency should be lauded for that effort. In the case of medical devices, field inspections of firms with pending pre-market approval applications found 17 of 25 to be out of compliance with good manufacturing practices according to an article in a recent health newsletter. If the device manufacturer is not in compliance with GMPs, what would then happen with regard to the pre-market application? Can it, can it be approved if they are not in compliance with good manufacturing practices? Let me let Mr. Benson answer. We, uh, around the first of the year, Mr. Chairman, we uh, instituted a uh, program that would require uh, pre-market approval inspections uh, prior to approvals of uh, PMAs, and that program stands now. So if those uh, manufacturers that you were referring to were substantially out of compliance, then their PMAs would not be approved. Now, would that be for the narrow particular program that for which the new drug application or the uh, approval is, is sought for? Uh, pre-market approval in connection with a device, or would it be f uh, simply that they are substantially out of compliance with approvals, rather with uh, good, good manufacturing practices? I think the the the, um, the thrust of your the, the thrust of your question is: uh, Are we going to approve a product that that comes out of a plant that that has compliance problems or that is not that's, performing adequately? And the answer correct. is: We will not. That's good. Uh, now, the um, Assistant Secretary for Health, Dr. James Mason, has suggested that FDA would not begin implementing Safe Medical Devices Act of 1990 until the Congress appropriates sufficient resources to do the job. I happen to think that we have major problems in terms of giving you the resources that you very well need, Doctor. Uh, I understand, however, that you do not share that sentiment. And, and have pledged that you will implement all provisions of the Act at some level using available resources. Could you give us now, briefly, and more extensively for the record, uh, a statement as to how you intend to reprogram your resources to accomplish this purpose? Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm in a bind, very honestly. It's, Dr. Mason and I are, are in full agreement, I mean, uh, uh, on what we need to do. Uh, the problem I have is that I, I believe very firmly I, those are very important amendments and I'm robbing Peter to pay Paul to, to, to get some of the startup right now and I'm not waiting. But, un, but unless there's additional money I mean, down the road, I'm not sure that, that some of those provisions, um, some of the hospital reporting, which are very important and I want, it, and I want to implement uh, I just, I, I'm running out of money, I'm, you know, Peter and Paul, we're, 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 in, uh, we're in difficult shape on medical devices. And, doc, and, th and that's what Dr. Mason and I, we're in agreement on that. Um, uh, the, the question is, uh, do I do nothing and say I'm not going to implement it? I don't think that's, I mean, we want to implement it. And, I'm, and, I, and I'm, we're in a startup phase, and, and I, we've shifted some resources. Uh, but I'm, I'm running out of uh, resources that I can shift. I want to implement it. I'm fighting for it. Dr. Mason is fighting for it. We agree that the budget resources have to be available if we're going to implement the Safe De uh, Medical Devices Act. And it's very important that we do. Doctor, we are in agreement both with regard to the enforcement of that statute, but also with regard to your, with the problems that you have in terms of your inability to carry forward your functions because of an adequate budget and an adequate number of personnel. That's why I think one of the reasons that you can anticipate being before this committee to, and, and, and the department can also to discuss uh, the general overall situation of 
self funding for FDA and funding your agency from the resources that you could generate by charging appropriate fees uh, to persons who are regulated. Uh, if you would, Doctor, please submit to us something along these lines because I believe they would be mutually helpful to us. Now, Doctor. Now, rather, Mr. Benson, this question to you. The subcommittee understands in fiscal year 1990, the agency approved 47 pre-market approval applications, compared with only 18 thus far in fiscal 90, 1991. Is that correct? I think that's correct, yes, sir. Now, how many do you anticipate for the remaining part of the fiscal year? Uh, I, I don't think that it will get substantially above the 18 to 20 level. Uh, does uh, do the pre-approval uh, inspections have anything to do with this situation? Well, clearly, as we a, a number of things have happened, I think. But clearly, as we've instituted that pre-approval uh, inspection program that we talked about earlier, and as the field has, I think, tightened their inspections and enforcement programs. Uh, that has, in fact, uh, 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 slowed some of the applications. I, I don't think it's that difference between this year and last year is due totally to that, but I think it certainly is in part due to that, yes. Well, what you're indicating to me is several things. One, additional funding would make it possible for you to move more rapidly and to cover a greater number of pre-market approval applications. Uh, is that correct? Yes, I think that's and, correct. And that you that you need funds for this purpose. That's correct. Uh, I believe it could also be inferred that uh, these matters tie rather closely to uh, inspections. That's and right. Without adequate inspections, your your ability to deal fully with the pre-market approval applications is somewhat impaired, because it relates to the GM uh, good manufacturing practices that I had been discussing earlier. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, doctor, thank you. Thank you. Um, doctor Peck, um, in, this, in addition to your function as the head of the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, you have assumed personal responsibility for the review of AIDS drugs. Is that correct? I've been the acting director of the Division of Antiviral Drug Products since January. Now, we will make available to you a letter. Uh, which, which I ask Mr. Chairman be inserted in the record as Exhibit D, uh, which you sent this past July to Mr. Ed Cohen, President of Barr, regarding proposed submission of an application for an expedited review of an ANDA for AZT. Now, everybody understands that this application cannot be approved unless Barr is successful in his patent challenge to Burroughs' welcome over AD AZT. Now, that patent challenge has arisen because the sister agency of FDA, the National Institutes of Health, has granted Barr on a non-exclusive basis their claim to the ownership of AZT's patent. Now, as you point out in the letter, should the lawsuit be successful, the generic competitor of AZT could be legally mar marketed as early as March next year. Now, we had come to the problem here of a backlog in the Office of Generic Drugs. That is a matter, I'm told, of three years. Yet the federal government, private insurance carriers of the country, ultimately aids patients and their families, pay billions of dollars, and in the case of patients, patients must endure bankruptcy after all the insurance runs out in order to get the only drug on the market which the Food and Drug Administration believes on full testing has any effectiveness in testing AIDS. Your letter, letter suggests that you do not see justification for expediting this application until there is some formal policy regarding blockbuster drugs. Now, I have several questions. First, uh, are you under any legal constraints that would prohibit an expedited review of this application, assuming that all matters then come together in an appropriate fashion? Mr. Chairman, if I may, if I can take uh, Certainly, the, these, these uh, questions. As I said in my opening statement this morning, I believe that the Commissioner has the discretion and should exercise it occasionally, rarely, to make sure that there is not a gap <laughs> between an important uh, generic drug and the time it comes off patent. And I have asked the Office of Generic Drugs uh, to come up with criteria so that the Commissioner's discretion could be appropriately guided. I do believe, however, that we need to get the generic drug process to a state 
where our normal course of business can handle block blockbusters. I think that's the most important thing. But there may be exceptions where, in the rare case, the commissioner should expedite review. With regard to AZT, right now, it is, I, it is can I talk about, it, 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 uh, it, there's an application, so I'm not sure uh, it, it's been publicly put in. I don't put say it. anything that's not proper. And I don't okay, l let, me not, let, let me not talk about, then, the, the specific application. But if there were, I'm waiting for criteria. I, I, I've asked, I, I believe we, the commissioner should have the discretion, I think, the commissioner does, and I think the com commissioner should exercise it. I'd like criteria to be developed so that, that, that we have some general framework so we're not just applying it arbitrarily and capricious. But if um, there were a case to be made, certainly in the AIDS area, generic AIDS drugs, you know, I'm not sure, is it just the first, is it the second generic? There are, there are many issues involved in here, but I think a very good case could be made um, if an important age drugs came off patent for the commissioner to expedite review. So what you're telling me is basically that you have reason to feel that this might be, uh, that this is first of all justification for a good, a good formal and, uh, com and uh, proper policy on the matter. I, I, but I, what, um, but I, I believe you're telling me also that if, if, if you didn't have it, you would feel that this was one of those instances in which you should proceed. Is that correct? That's correct. I see. And I think that's a very satisfactory answer, Doctor. Now, I uh, guess that, that uh, completes the questions. And, and, and uh, Doctor, I thank you and your associates very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question that I would wish to ask. A constituent called me uh, recently saying they had read a report that FDA had received, had uh, seized or banned in some way approximately 13 million pounds of imported cheese. And according to the news report, uh, this represented 40% of the amount of the cheese that was tested. I don't know whether you're familiar with this or not. Anybody familiar with this? I know it's in the newspaper, but I'm not really familiar with it. I think it was over a period of time, so go ahead. Well, we, we, we do have from time to time uh, problems with cheese. And uh, as such, I uh, want to make sure that we continue to analyze cheese that's imported in the United States for any uh, harmful or deleterious substance. Well, it, it, doesn't this seem threatening that such a large amount of imported cheese could be contaminated? I, I, I'm unaware as to whether or not this was all in one shipment or over a period of time. Uh, it is quite possible we have had in the past automatic detention on certain cheese. This may fall into that. If, if possible, what I'd like to do is just take whatever you have and, and submit something for the record, I think. Well, I, I would just ask you, I, I didn't mean to pull that one on you out of the blue, but I just, I'll ask you to, to if you will, submit to the record. Uh, We'd be happy to do that. Question. Well, thank you, all of you, very much. Just a minute. We're not, I'm assuming we're not quite through here. I thought uh, that the chairman was, uh, was through, but I, I believe we have some more questions I'm informed by staff, so I guess everybody can sit back down for a minute or two. <laughs> well, the chairman left because he thought I was doing so well. Well, we'll just, we'll just go to some additional questions here. Okay. Dr. Kessler, the American Law Division of the Library of Congress has provided an interpretation of the current regulations governing the advertisement of prescription drugs. Its interpretation suggests that the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act gives the FDA sufficient authority to regulate advertising of, prescription, of prescriptive drugs and that the language in the Act does not make a distinction as to audience. Under this view, the FDA would not need additional legislation or a change in legislation to propose and promulgate regulations specifically tailored for direct-to-consumer advertising. Uh, our staff provided a copy of this interpretation to the FDA. You concur with the American Law Division interpretation? We would not need additional statutory Yes, um, let, let me let uh, David Adams of uh, Omar Reporter answer that question. 
It, we, we do concur with the conclusion that uh, no additional legislation is necessary uh, to regulate direct consumer advertising under those provisions. Dr. Kessler, since the early 1990s, the subcommittee has been monitoring the efforts of the Food and Drug Administration regarding direct consumer advertising of prescription drugs and have noted with appreciation that you have conveyed to the industry that uh, improper advertising without fair balance will not be tolerated. That's correct. Are existing regulations applicable and appropriate to, to address direct to consumer advertising of prescription drugs? As I said in my opening comments, the, the, the existing regs uh, adopted now 20 years ago make no mention, no distinction uh, between uh, direct-to-consumer and physician advertising. Um, but in fact, in many aspects, again as I said in my opening testimony, um, they achieve a result uh, with regard to what can be broadcast on TV that I happen to be in agreement with. Uh, they are very restrictive, in part because of the requirement that there be a brief summary. I think, though, that when it comes to print, reading this you know, six-point font um, that this, uh, was originally designed to be information to be provided to doctors, there's something about that that just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, and if we're going to continue to allow DTC advertising uh, in print, I think we have an obligation to make sure that maybe there's a better way to do that. Um, and we have that under discussion right now. In the past, Dr. Kessler, when the subcommittee staff has asked when the agency would develop regulations, the response was a reluctant one. As one FDA staffer put it, it would open up a can of worms. Do you intend that the FDA issue regulations on this subject, and if so, when would this occur? L let me tell you what my priorities are. And uh, Ms. Witt, who heads the, uh, the division, uh, can comment. First priority, I believe, uh, is the enforcement of the existing statute. And we're working very hard on that. I think it's very important um, that we be willing to bring uh, enforcement actions against those ads we believe are false and misleading and that are not fair balanced. That is priority number one. Priority number two, um, this murky gray zone uh, between scientific exchange and promotion um, I think is, uh, needs to be addressed and needs to be addressed through rulemaking. Uh, that's priority number two. Uh, I'm not ready to commit to rulemaking uh, just because I'm not sure, uh, I mean, it, 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 it falls behind those two priorities. Um, but if, if, certainly if direct-to-consumer advertising uh, gets out of hand um, and we can't, uh, if there is not fair balance in it, if it's not done in such a way that uh, uh, assures uh, it's in the public interest, we will uh, move it up on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, of course, share Dr. Kessler's priorities. I want you to know that we are examining the issue of fair balance uh, in, in direct-to-consumer advertising, and we are looking at methods of trying to improve the um, incredibly technical, tiny brief summary that now appears and are looking at whether we can do something in the short term without regulations or whether in the long term we're going to have to have new regulations. But as Dr. Kessler said, we have some other priorities that um, are taking much of our time right now. Well, I could, uh, I can certainly understand why it's a gray area uh, that you're getting into, as, uh, as you mentioned. When would a when would an individual or a patient know whether or not a specific drug was indicated for a problem uh, that they may have if they saw some sort of advertisement? Um, it seems to me it would place the physician in a very difficult position trying to deal uh, with what the patient had seen in the advertisement. Is this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make no mistake about what I just said. There is no excuse for advertisements, direct-to-consumer, television or print, that are false and misleading right now. We will take action. I'm just saying whether further rulemaking is in order, 
I'm just, uh, I'm just not ready to answer that question. Well, I guess not even whether it's false or misleading, but if there's a, a drug that is indicated in a specific condition and it is not false, still there is a problem with that being advertised to the general public. I, I didn't, uh, I, you and I are in agreement, Dr. Rowland. Um, I sit, you know, when I sat in an emergency room, if we start advertising antibiotics on television, there's an, you know, there's enough pressure. Uh, when patients come in, um, and, and they come in to me, you know, to send somebody out without a prescription, they want something. They want a, they want a prescription. Um, and and when, some, when, a, when a mother or a father brings in a kid with a viral infection, I send them, uh, you know, home without, and I say, look, it's a viral infection. It's going to get better on its own. Sometimes they're not very happy with me. And I can imagine a world, uh, you know, home without, and I say, look, it's a viral infection. It's going to get better on its own. Sometimes they're not very happy with me. And I can imagine a world where we start advertising all antibiotics on television um, and the, the, the pressure on physicians. The bottom line is my colleagues, the physician colleagues that I've talked to about it, really are not in favor of it. Um, and even most pharmaceutical firms uh, that I've talked to, and they submitted comments in the early 80s, and I think a lot of them share the, the same uh, uh, the, the shame view today, they're not very interested uh, in doing it for exactly the reason you raised, because the doctors uh, don't want that kind of pressure. They don't want to be forced to prescribe this or that. They want to prescribe something that's in the best interest of the patient. Yeah, I can see if uh, and I had made a diagnosis of a certain disease and I told the patient what it was and prescribed, say, erythromycin, and the patient said, well, I don't want that because I saw what tetracycline was better for that. A a absolutely. Now, there, there may be a small subset of drugs for which patients aren't aware that they exist, not to treat uh, illnesses or specific symptoms, uh, illnesses or, or, or serious diseases, uh, but I could conceive uh, of a class of drugs for which patients don't normally go to their doctors. And perhaps there's something that's more effective by prescription that's not over the counter. I'm, I don't know how one defines that small subclass, I'm, you know, and, but there may be some instances where the risk of overuse is outweighed by the benefit of information. It's my understanding that the FDA is currently developing policy statements on several categories of drug, drug advertising. Is that right? Is that we, we, we are especially in, in, the, in that gray area that I referred to um, at, between what's promotional and what's scientific exchange. Uh, we, are, uh, we are developing policy. Well, policy statements uh, don't carry the weight of regulations and are the subject of uh, two petitions submitted to the FDA which request that the agency adopt regulations to clarify their authority on direct to consumer advertising. Is it your position that the agency will continue to regulate through policy statements? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the agency should not regulate through policy statement. In the area of scientific exchange and promotion, that should be done by formal, I mean by, by regulations. So you'll go to rulemaking to do that? Yes, thing. sir. It's going to, you know, obviously it takes time. It's not going to be done uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, some of the rulemaking, as you point out, I mean, it's taken years. There's some downside to that. But I think the public process um, is very important. Uh, but in this area of promotion, I think we have made a decision to go through rulemaking. So you, you, you can't give me some sort of time frame then. It uh, could take several months or... It, it's going to take more than several months to deal uh, with uh, that whole area. Some of the arguments emanating from the uh, petitions indicate that the agency does not have the right to pre-approve advertisements before they are aired. In essence, once the product is approved, the agency can then require copies of the documents and assess the appropriateness of the advertisement. Under these circumstances, how does the agency plan to monitor such a proliferation of prescription drug advertising? Let me let Ann Witt uh, answer that. But, but let me say that, you know, we've gone from, uh, we're putting more resources in it. Um, I think we're up to, what, 24? 24. Uh, I think we have a, uh, in, uh, by fiscal year 93, I think we've, uh, uh, something like 42. Uh, we're recruiting new doctors, new lawyers. There's a, there's a branch. Um, so it's, it's a resource question. 
I just want to add that we are painfully aware of uh, how much promotional activity is out there and what, how extensive our surveillance responsibilities are. Right now we're trying to identify the most efficient means of improving our surveillance and we are hiring new people all the time. Dr. Kessler, your November the 14th, 1990 article on direct to consumer advertising of prescription drugs, which you co-authored with uh, Mr. Wayne Pines of Person uh, Marstella, points out that direct to consumer advertising of prescription drugs, both in print and on television, is becoming more common and that more aggressive regulation may result. If perception develops that the increase in prescription drug advertising and promotion is resulting in inaccurate and misleading information, Dr. Kessler, in addition to ads for Nicorette and Rogaine on network television, we now have a proliferation of advertisements in the form of video news releases for prescription drugs such as Theopolin, Xanax, and Carolone, and advertisements geared to lay audiences on cable TV such as Lifetime TV. Do these types of ads present justification for more aggressive regulation? You mentioned video news releases, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. in there. Uh, we have acted over the last couple of weeks to require that video news releases as we see, because we see them as promotional, in many, they're, they're packages of material. Um, and we reminded the regulated industry that they need to be submitted as well as other promotional material. Um, I think that the, uh, from what I hear, uh, the industry has gotten the message that we are looking closely at those um, and certainly will act against any inappropriate, uh, any inappropriate promotion through those vehicles. Well, With you, excuse me. Go ahead. Well, do you believe that these types of messages present a fair and well-balanced presentation of the safety and efficacy of certain prescription drugs? Again, I, I, I don't want to make broad overstatements. I, I, my bottom line is that I am concerned that the, 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 the fair balance, telling the good with the bad, the benefits as well as the risks. I'm just not sure as a physician you can do that I mean, in an advertising context. That's my bottom line. I'm just not sure in a 10 or a 30 second spot you really can convey fair balance. It may be possible and in certain instances may be useful. Consumers want information. Uh, I mean, let's face it, I mean, uh, you and I know that our patients, the, the, they have the, the PDR, they're watching lifetime television, there's a demand for information. I'm just not sure that advertising is the right forum for conveying the risks and benefits about a drug. I am all in favor of appropriate patient educational materials. I don't think we as a country do a very good job about it. I think that we all, I think the, the industry, our pharmacies, our physicians, the medical community, uh, healthcare providers in general, have to do a better job of consumer education, patient information. I'm just not sure advertising is the right forum to That's convey that about, information. Uh, how much informed consent should be included in advertising? That, I mean, if you're going to talk about all of the possibilities, and advertising of prescription drug becomes very complex, doesn't it? It becomes awfully complex, Mr. Chairman. What uh, requirements is the agency considering short of banning such ads to assure that the consumer is not misled into believing that these ads are legitimate news releases? These advertisements are not legitimate news releases. Hmm? The, 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 um, are legitimate renewed releases. Right. The, the, there are, look, we, there is, I, I've expressed my concern about direct-to-consumer advertising. Um, but I also have to say that there are instances um, where, I mean, there is a First Amendment um, and we have to uh, proceed, we have to tread lightly. Um, and there may be instances uh, where, for, uh, for a whole host of reasons, whether it's uh, requirements under other laws, under the security laws, th there is an affirmative obligation uh, to release information. Uh, but I think that uh, you sort of see, know it when you see it, the difference between news and uh, what's uh, out there with the, uh, the real purpose of increasing uh, market share. 
FDA has determined that ads uh, such as Rogaine are in compliance with, with their regulations. However, uh, the ad does not indicate that the product is only effective in about 30% of the cases and only if daily application is made for a lifetime. As required by regulations, the ad replicates labeling information in the fine print, uh, but the print is too small to read and the language is likely to be too complex or too arduous for the average reader uh, to read. Also, the fine print is found on the back of the page or on the following page. This considered, in your opinion, to meet the spirit of the law to provide for the consumer fair balance? It's my point exactly. I think it is very hard um, in these kind of formats to achieve fair balance, uh, to, to come up uh, exactly in what percentage of patients this works. Uh, I'm just not sure advertising is the right format. Not long ago, the staff sent, uh, to you, this staff sent to your staff a copy of an interesting development in the ongoing evolution of drug advertising. It was a lengthy videotape produced by Upjohn, which is offered free to customers in drugstores or available by phoning the company. In order to promote this tape, the company airs a minute-long commercial promoting the product and the tape. It encourages the viewer to call and send away for the ad and offers them $10 in inducement. Have you had an opportunity to view this new advertising scheme? Uh, I've, I've not viewed it myself. I have discussed it with Ann Witt. Yes, we have viewed it. Okay. You think that this uh, approach uh, presents to the viewer the appropriate fair balance before uh, being lured with a cash reward? We are certainly concerned about the technique. At this point, um, we have not determined exactly what our authority is to address this sort of incentive to the patient. It's not a traditional um, advertisement or labeling that we would ordinarily regard as misleading, but we are certainly concerned about the tactic. Dr. Kessler, I have here an advertisement for Irizol, a generic brand of Pediazol. I introduce this ad as an Exhibit E. This ad, although not for consumers specifically, is directed to pharmacists and other customers. This ad is technically a reminder, that is, those which would call attention to the name of the drug product but do not include indications for dosage recommendations for use of the product. Yet this ad suggests that the product be used for cold, influenza, and otitis media. Could this at least trigger a brief summary? Mr. Chairman, I, I would need a couple of minutes to, to look at that, but l let me raise the, the issue that I think you're addressing. There are two exemptions under our regulations, one for reminder ads and one for, quote, institutional ads, um, whereby you don't need to provide the brief summary. Reminder ads, as I understand it, basically the, the reg was uh, intended, uh, Dr. Rowland, uh, so that if a company wants to put the name of a drug on a pad or on a pencil, it would not need to attach the whole brief summary. Institutional ads are ads that start talking about, you know, go see your doctor uh, for hypertension. They don't mention individual drugs. The, neither one would require uh, brief summaries. We are seeing, um, and um, we have some concern, and let me leave it at that, about the, the creative uses of both reminder ads and institutional ads, and especially when they're intermixed. Um, it is something we're exploring. It, it goes beyond any one company. Um, but I think that there is certainly some reminder ads and institutional ads that are, that are looking more and more like drug-specific ads. I'm not sure if that was your, you know, that gets to the heart of it. but. I've just now had an opportunity to look at this advertisement, and it clearly suggests an intended use for this product. Um, it would therefore not meet our definition of a reminder ad. Dr. Kessler, the August 15th edition of Health News Daily reports that on July the 16th, the AMA met with the FDA to discuss a proposed project 
for an industry-sponsored publication of single-topic education medical reports that would include articles on drug research turned down by the AMA peer-reviewed journals. Uh, these proposed publications would be sponsored by direct grants from drug companies and by advertising. The FDA apparently had no objections. How can you justify that position given your stand on company-sponsored articles? Mr. Chairman, I, I, the headlines that I saw the next day um, after that meeting was U.S. pressure, uh, U.S. Uh, government pressures AMA to drop plan. Um, I thought, uh, again, I, I would have to read the, that article. Um, I was very candid with the AMA. I think it was a good discussion. Um, I, again, I don't want to see promotion uh, under the guise of scientific exchange. Um, I'd be happy to provide the article uh, that I saw in the New York Times, I think it was, uh, for the record. I'll ask you to do that, uh, Dr. Kessler. I'm informed that the subcommittee staff will be submitting additional questions uh, to you. And now this is for real. We're going to stop right here. So, <laughs> thank all of you very much for coming today. I do appreciate it. That concludes our coverage of this hearing on the Food and Drug Administration. For more information, write to the subcommittee at 2125 Rayburn Office Building, Washington, D.C., 20515. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate everything. I appreciate it. From Washington, D.C., this is C SPAN 2, a cable satellite public affairs network. This reminder for the latest schedule in.